Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 130, Rainy Day AMA. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, so today we were going to talk about next step train games from Ticket to Ride, but I realized I actually have a number of games in my piles of shame and obligation that may be perfect suggestions for this. So I decided to hold off uh, at least a week, maybe two. We'll see how long it takes. Due to this last minute change in direction, I figured tonight would be a good time for us to do an AMA. And since it's been drizzling outside my window all day today, and we're currently under a thunderstorm warning, I decided to go with the name Rainy Day AMA. The things we talked about when our original plans didn't quite go as we expected. Now, after answering questions from our lobby, the chat room here on Twitch, I do have a review, a uh, much anticipated review of the third Robotech game from Solar Flare Games, and that is Invid Invasion. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Our first comment comes from our White Star White Box Science Fiction Role-Playing Galaxy Edition review. Isaac Alexander writes, but did it come in a white box? I, unfortunately, no, Isaac. Though I gotta admit, that's actually a really good question, because if you didn't know better, if you just seen the title, you may think it is a box set. Instead, this is a digest-sized hardcover RPG rulebook and not a full starter set. Though I gotta say, James Spawn, if you're listening, Obi Spawn Kenobi, where are you? Um, I would love to see a White Star box set. I think that would be awesome with a set of dice, maybe throw some special symbols on there, character sheets, some maps, character artwork, an included adventure, and then maybe some artwork showing off like the unique races, like the star squirrels and stuff like that. I, I would honestly, I'd buy a white box or white star box set. I think that'd be awesome. White star, white box set. Yes. Now, next up, a couple of comments on our D&D Adventure Begins review from last episode. Rob Fenimore Thorough and well-written. Bummer about Hasbro sucking on the component issue. <laughs> and M. Krawek, with that gag, names sounds like the designers were more than a little inspired by Tunnels and Trolls, too. Well, thanks for the comments, folks. Um, I don't know if Tunnels and Trolls actually inspired this game at all. It seems like it's made by some modern designers who probably haven't even heard of Tunnels and Trolls. But I do know that's like a D&D &D retro clone. Well, actually clone, not even retro clone. It came out back in the 70s that definitely had more of a tongue-in-cheek look at fantasy. And I got to say, this box does have a lot of puns. And the, where there aren't puns, I'm just assuming they're going over my head because they're probably puns about something that I missed. Well, with Garinto arriving in the hands of backers, we've got a spike in views on our Garinto review and this comment. Jean Cloutier writes, Great summary. My Kickstarter just arrived and we were playing today. By the way, where'd you get that awesome designer's <laughs> shirt, Mo? I had to remember this comment was here. I totally could have wore that shirt. Well, thanks for the comment, Sean. I hope you're enjoying Garinto. I can't see how you wouldn't be. I still think that that's going to be the, it's going to be the next Azul. We just need enough people talking about it. Now, as for the shirt, it comes from Geeky Goodies, uh, Chris Cormier's shop. Though after seeing this comment, I did try to go get a link and I was going to drop a link to that shirt. I can't find that shirt anymore. So I don't know if it's sold out or Chris doesn't make that shirt anymore. I'm not sure which it is, but I can't find that one. Now, what he does still have is the game mechanics one, which is one I want to get because it looks exactly the same, but it's a list of game mechanics. And I'm totally going to redo our mechanic episode and I'll point at each one. I think that'd be a cool episode. Well, next we have a couple of comments on our recent topic of filler card games. Chamberlain 2 Sushi Party Go supports more players and has a variety of sushi types that you can swap in and out. And Todd Zercher, Channel A is a big win at our gaming table. Sushi Go Party, not Sushi Party Go. Ah, yeah, that's right. Close enough. So thanks, Todd and Chamberlain. Chamberlain, I think, is the, the Wilt Chamberlain who often joins us in our chat room, though I haven't seen him tonight. Now, I thought I had heard that the original Sushi Go was still better for small groups. Now, I don't know, maybe I heard wrong or I'm remembering wrong. So what I'll probably do is when I do up the blog version of that post, we'll change the recommendation to just pick up the party edition. I think kind of like Telestrations, it's like, why wouldn't you just get the big box version? Because it's better. Plus, um, from what Chamberlain explained to me, there's different sets.
sets of cards you can swap in and out and that you can ramp up the difficulty and stuff. So it sounds like a great suggestion. That's just bad on me because I've never played Sushi Go Party. Now, as for Channel A, that one I'd never heard of. I looked it up. Looks cool. So what we'll do is what we usually do and drop a link in the show notes for anyone who's interested. Next up, a question from our King Me review from mm-hmm. Lisa Pacheco. Does the king have to be in the area he controls to equal two checkers for the count of how many checkers you have in that area? A good question, Lisa. Now, first up, I got to say, this has been happening more and more, and I think it's kind of cool. I I wasn't sure how to think of it at first, but we've been getting a number of rule questions on our videos and after our reviews, Uh, most of them are Gloomhaven related, which kind of makes sense because our FAQ is still a ridiculously popular video on YouTube, Uh, but Jaws of the Lion questions and well now King Me, but I've had other ones. We haven't always shared them here, but I think what I'm going to do is feature more of these when I get them, because I'm assuming if one person has the question, other people probably do as well. So getting back to Lisa's question. So King me is a area control version of checkers fantastic game check out our review for more information in it though a checker is kinged by landing on a spot with a crown on it which is different than reaching the other side of the board right normal checkers reach the other side of the board you get to take one of your captured checkers and put it on top that's different in king me and king me you just have to move on to a crown space then you take it and if anyone jumps over your king they become the king they take the crown from your checker now any checker that has a crown now counts as two checkers in any region they're in when doing scoring what region the crown came from does not matter at all it's always two checkers anywhere on the board so i hope that helps lisa well finally someone who bothered to get through our full techlandia review congratulations jason bachelor at mori 57 that's m-o-r-i 57 on twitter writes i completely agree with your assessment there's room for a game with this theme i would mm-hmm. definitely strike up a bargain with some eater of souls to get a game based on laundry files this was so short of the mark as to be almost laughable is there a razzies for board games oh thanks for the comment jason and for checking out the full review um if there was a razzie for board games this would definitely be uh top of my nomination list though i gotta say in general i'm kind of glad there isn't a razzies for board games because i'd rather all of us content creators spend more time talking about the games we love instead of wasting time on the sour fruit that's out there like i don't think i personally would want a raspberry award for board games and the only reason i actually reviewed this game is because it was an obligation it was sent me to me to review normally i do a little more research ahead of time i don't know I, the, again the theme sounded cool like the, the modern dungeon crawl everything sounded good about the game until we actually sat down and played it still has a great theme and a great story well that's it for this week's comment send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and hit us up on social media one quick announcement before we get to our main topic tonight our terraforming mars digital giveaway has ended or landed i guess or terraformed finished thank you everyone who took the time to head over to tabletopbellhop.com and enter so this one's funny to me because one of the reasons i wanted to do this digital giveaway is because of the fact it wouldn't cost us a fall small fortune in shipping unfortunately when we have contests where we're giving away actual games the people who win tend to be far away and not in canada and it cost us a significant amount to give away a free game so i figured by giving away something digital we just have to email someone a code now very ironically our winner tonight just happens to be local and that winner is uh, kevin reno better known as tech 2674 from our lobby and it was actually the fact that tech joined us in the live episode we announced this giveaway that earned him the prize yeah, the winning entry that came up on Rafflecopter tells me like what they did to enter to win. And it was literally the code we gave out in the chat that night that won him a copy of the game. So congratulations, Kevin. I'll get that code over to you right after the show. And if I don't get it to you, just hit me up with a reminder because I may forget depending on how long we go tonight. We're here to answer your game, gaming or game night questions. Tonight, due to a last minute change in plans, we're going to host another live Q&A with the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. So you guys can start sending in those questions right now. Now, as I mentioned at the top of the show, I had originally planned to talk about next step games from Ticket to Ride tonight. 
And that topic actually grew from an interesting conversation we were having with our patrons on the Tabletop Bellhop Discord channel, which all of our patrons get access to. And if you were a patron, you could be there too. Now, Math Guy Dave asked if we'd ever talked about next step games from mass market games. Like, have you ever talked about the next step from Monopoly or the next step from Sorry or whatever? And I mentioned how we did that for Catan, literally on our second podcast episode ever. So it was right when we got started. And I talked about how I liked first breaking down what people liked about Catan and then using that to offer up game suggestions. So then later in the same week, Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, asked me on Facebook to recommend some next step train games from Ticket to Ride because he was considering picking up a birthday gift for a train game fan. So I thought this would be a perfect topic. So Sean and I, Sean from Hamilton, my podcast co-host, too many Sean's, uh, we're checking out the Puffing Billy website after the conversation on Discord, and we were looking at their list of train games, and I saw two games on that list that I have in my piles of shame and obligation, Great Western Trail and Rail Pass, and I'm like, oh, wait a minute, I, like those are, they're sitting right here, I can, well, one, I can't, actually, I can't see, I can see one of them, the other one we're going to actually open up at the after show tonight, if you stick around, um, so, and then I also got a copy of Irish Gage for my birthday, now, this may be second guess covering the topic tonight. It just makes sense to me to try these games first so that I can decide if they fit the topic or not. And I'm going to guess that one's going to fit, one's not. Like, I think Rail Pass is going to be a perfect next step game, but I'm pretty sure Great Western Trail probably goes to a difficulty level more than a step above Trick or Ride, and I think Irish Gage is a step above that. But still, I want to try it. I want to, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm going to play Great Western Trail and go, you know what, if you played Catan and Ticket to Ride, you can pick this up. So we are going to get to that topic, but it's probably going to be at least one week, maybe two. It depends how long it's going to take for me to get those games played before I can fully talk about them. Now, I don't necessarily have to get the reviews out or anything, but I do want to play them each at least once. All right. Well, Roger in our chat room has asked yep. an interesting question, and he's, he's being a little self-effacing about it, but it actually is a reasonable question to ask. Okay. So, He's noticed that many of his game prototypes tend to send people running out the door and hiding under the table. It seems that the typical gamer has a real aversion to half-finished games and unsightly prototypes. Is this a common thing with board gamers, or is it just my games that are the problem? Well, Roger, I don't think it's just your games. No, I really don't. Definitely not. So a good example of this, right? Sean was here for this, so he'll, he'll be able to back me up on this. We're at Breakout Con, the first time we've gone to Breakout Con, and they are working with uh, Proto-Tio, is that what yep, they're called? Proto-Tio. Yeah, Proto-Tio, which is a Toronto-based, GTA-based, I shouldn't even say Toronto, GTA-based prototyping community all about getting new board games out to new people and helping new publishers and getting play tests and everything like that. A huge resource for people like Roger, people like you, trying to get their games out there. They were outside the main gaming hall. They had eight to 10 tables, rough guess. Oh, I think they had more than that. The, I think they actually, I think they were actually up to like 12 or 16 even. Okay, so, so 12 or 16 yeah. tables versus the 200 in the big gaming hall. Yeah. The entire weekend, I maybe saw 30 people in that area checking it out, and they yeah. tended to be the same people trying different games. And you're right. Uh, gamers have a real aversion to half-finished, unsightly prototypes. No one wants to play. Like, part of the problem is, and we mentioned this on the show more a couple years back than recently, the number of games that come out in a year are ridiculous now. There are a, a large number of games. Now, not talking about the time of COVID, I honestly don't know how many games came out in 2020 because there were lots of constraints there. But there was at least one year before uh, 2019, 5,000 games were released in one day the day of Essen. That's 5,000 new board games. These are complete. These aren't prototypes. These are finished, published, viable games you could bring home and play. And you only have so much time to play games in your life, right? If you're, you're a gamer hobby and you like playing games, you can only fit in so many games. And well, what of those 5,000 games should you play? And that's where people like us come in, right? Reviewers and board game geek ratings and lots of other things that kind of, and, and the hype train and Kickstarter and media and all that to try to get you to try those games. With 5,000 finished games out there, 500 of which are probably amazing games, why would I go play someone I don't know's half finished prototype where I could play a finished game? Yeah. And, and that's a real thing. It's tough. I mean, especially, I almost think it was doing a disservice to Prototio where they placed them in mm -hmm. Breakout Con. In, 
in on an initial surface way, it makes sense. Hey, all these people are going to walk Just by don't. your tables to play board games. But that's the problem. They're walking past your table to play a fancy, nice, you know, $75 board game that they haven't got at home, but is in the library of games uh, available at Breakout Con. And that's in their mind, playing that nice, mm -hmm. big, meaty game that they're hoping for. And, and so seeing someone who, you know, may only just have index cards or, you know, strips of paper and, and dice is a tough sell for someone mm -hmm. who could be going in and playing brass or, you know, whatever, or whatever, maybe. whatever the new hotness uh, yeah. is, right? Uh, that, that year, the year we, we were there, it was planet, right? You get to play with this yes. awesome, great new hexagonal three-dimensional shape, or you can go play with index cards. Um, now, personally, I actually was trying to get involved in prototypo. I really like doing prototyping. I think it's, I think it's fun. Um, what I have found is I don't actually enjoy online prototyping. Uh, mm -hmm. I do like sitting with a designer and talking about their game and, and, and playing with the pieces they've got and talking about ideas. Um, I have done, tried some online prototyping and I'm finding it's not fulfilling that same thing for me. Uh, so I'm hoping maybe when, uh, you know, all this wonderful <laughs> mess is over, uh, I can go back because I had actually tried to get involved with ProtoTO and uh, as, a, as a prototyper. Mm -hmm. What I've found seems to work because i know game developers I've, I've got an indie game right here from one of our <laughs> friends this this is the the official published version because he couldn't sell it to a company so he went through drive through cards and i know what he's involved in and what tends to happen is you have to get a bunch of game developers together and you play test each other's games because yeah. for one it's a self-fulfilling prophecy right it's a closed loop it's a i'll play test your game you'll play test mine right you're both getting something out of it because another problem with playing people's pro player prototype games is it's a selfless act in a way, right? Like the, the gamer is not getting anything out of it except probably an incomplete experience <laughs> and in a game that doesn't quite work, right? Compared to playing something that's tried and true and tested, whereas the prototyper is getting tons of feedback. So it, it's, it's not as much of a two-way street, whereas if you are all game designers together, you've got that two-way street. And the problem is we're in Windsor, right? Windsor's not that big. I'm sure there are other, are other game designers out there, but I know Rogers reached out on Facebook and tried to meet others, and I just don't know if they're out there. And I think it's only really game designers that are interested in that, right? You have to have that, that design gene, that, that urge to make your own thing, or a really critical, I like giving feedback to people urge, right? And, one and of those two. And that one tends to be me, unfortunately. Yeah, that's why I was... Uh, so I, I think that has to be there. And I just think Windsor's too small, right? Yeah. Now, once things open up, I think there is a group that gets together in Michigan, in Detroit, but I'm not positive, right? So I, I think it's trying to find the group of people. Now, in bigger cities, like I know all the Jamie Stabemeyers and I'm trying to think, there's a, there's a whole group of them out in the Seattle area, right? And they get together once a month. And these are people who do, like play games and publish games like Wingspan, right? Like big games. They all sit out and they they sit and they share their games. It's it's they 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 the the rule is you can't show your game off unless you play tested so many other games. And I don't know right. the number. But it's like you have to sit there and go and play play tests with other people first. And only once you've done so many do you get your other one out. So yeah, Tax mentioned he knows of one other game designer in Windsor. Like technically, I'm a game designer. I wrote some RPGs, but like it's, it's not my passion. I'm not about the game design. One, one of the other things you run into, and and one of the things that Proto, Proto To does is they run a uh, well. There's a few things they they do run a game cafe night once a month, uh, where they take over a uh, yeah they take See, over a game big. cafe and they bring in you know it, it's a bunch of designers mostly playing each other's games, but anyone else who wants to drop by can. And then there's also ProtoTO, where the designers have to pay, uh, I think it's like $15 or something to come in and show off their games, but players only have to show up and pay like five bucks to be able to play right. all the games they want. Um, because one of the things you run into, I think, with the game designers playing game designers games is game designers have a mindset, mm -hmm. which isn't always the same as a player's mindset, yeah. right? And so I, someone who doesn't care about design and just wants to play a good game is going to look at a game uh with a different view and a different mm -hmm. uh, eye to the game in front of them um so see now the other thing too you I, that wouldn't be the end of it 
Like I realize Roger's still in the early testing stages. Right then, I think you're fine going with game designers, but don't stop. Like if you are involved in the group, you've got to get it blind play tested with the public and no blind. You can't be there. You can't be coaching. You can't be answering questions, right? Like that. that's, that's the thing we find the most wrong with games, including one we're going to be talking about later today, actually. I think one of the issues with the game we're going to review tonight is that it was kept in a small group of people who all got it and all understood it perfectly and didn't, don't, understand how people outside that group don't quite get it yeah. and and that is a huge problem and that's a, that is the problem i can see with always playing with designers designers do have a different way of playing games and, and thinking about games and while anyone's willing to design games is usually willing to get into that nitty-gritty and they're going to prefer games that have that nitty-gritty right like they're, they're probably not there to play a variation on uno that plays quicker or you know uno with two new cards they're there to deep dive something and tear it apart yeah, like I know one of my one of my first actual game playtesting experiences was at QCC. Um, you were off playing a game, and someone uh, D and I sat down and played somebody's, um, you know, collect and deliver pirate themed game. Um, and it was it was a really it was they had a lot of work done on it, but it was interesting because there were some you know good questions that came up about mm -hmm. uh, you know about what the dice were doing and, and some variability questions. The game was getting there but it still had some of those questions and they clearly hadn't thought about those questions. Yep. It was, you know, well, you know, why is, why, why has D never failed anything ever in her, like, you know, yeah. yes, we know D is good at games, but there's something more to it here. And I think the dice in the fact were the problem that they hadn't thought about their percentages properly for mm -hmm. that or something, uh, something along those lines. I don't remember the exact details, but you know, and, and you know, valuable help like that is just, you know, someone else, who plays things differently. You know, D has yep. a, a way of playing games and I have a way of playing games that are wildly divergent. Uh, and so we're both going to be able to find different holes or different strangeness in your mm -hmm. game versus those people who've played it from the beginning and have seen every variation of the rules you've ever tried yep. and know that, oh, well, I can't do that that thing anymore because you patched that up a while ago. Whereas I might try it anyway and see if it's, yeah. it, without knowing it was broken and or fixed. Or even worse, you play it the way you always have, and it ends up that rule got cut out, and you didn't realize that the rule got cut out. Yep. But of course, it's played that way because that's how we played it the whole time, right? So that's definitely a thing. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that really answers the question, except for the fact that yeah, it's definitely not you. It, it's definitely a bias, <laughs> and I have it, right? Like I, I wish I could try Rogers games, but I have a pile of obligation and a pile of shame and a hundred games downstairs I haven't played yet, and. I have four hours tonight to do something. And I'll admit most of the time that ends up being watching TV because I'm burnt out from other stuff I've been doing all day. Right. And the other thing too is, is it's playing a prototype. And there's more of an investment there, right? For one, there's, there's a, there's a social investment, right? Like you are expecting feedback and I have to provide that. And I may not be comfortable doing that. Whereas if I go play a game in my basement and I hate it, I can just put it away. Whereas if I play Roger's game and I hate it, like it depends on your personality type. And for me, that's a mood thing. Like some days I'll totally tear into Roger's game and tell him, I don't know what you're trying to do here. This just doesn't work. Or I'll be like, you got something good here, but it needs work, which Roger's heard that advice from me. But other days I just don't have the spoons to do that, right? Like it's emotionally taxing as well as intellectually taxing. Absolutely. And I have to say, I've, I've enjoyed sitting down with Roger and again, playing at the table with his uh, combat game and, and, you know, feeling those dice and seeing the, uh, the pieces in front of me and, and thinking about ideas, whether he has or hasn't. Yeah, Dan is pointing out, I do still have some feedback I need to give if the game does not play well. Uh, just tune into our last episode for that. I know that's different than talking to the person to their face, though. I, I would have a hard time talking to Dan Ackerman about Techlandia. I, I think. wouldn't. I, I'll, I'll sit down for a beer with Dan Ackerman any day. Yeah, see, I, I don't know. I, I have a feeling, though, based on that game, I still have a feeling that Dan totally knows that's, I, yeah, that's, 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 that's how his game of, is. I, Dan seems to me to be a cool enough guy that I would be able to sit yeah. and chat with him and ask him. I, I would actually love to ask him, okay, what did you yeah. realistically hear? Let's sit down, you yeah, know, person real to person, and, and where were you going with this game? was there actually a bigger plan or yeah. is this a, is this as much of a joke as it ended up being sorry to say <laughs> yeah so yeah i think i think our, our final answer for roger is yes it's normal um typical gamers do have an aversion to half finished games and i and, and to be honest i think for a good reason there's only going to be it like gamers are already a small subset the amount of gamers who are willing to play other people's unfinished games is even smaller <laughs> 
And then the ones willing to give feedback doing that are even smaller than that. And the problem is we're, we're not, like you said, Rogers noted in the chat that he, he actually works with the Seattle group. And I actually wonder if it's the same one I was talking about earlier that has some rather big names in the industry who all play each other's games before they're published. Um, I, I, you need to find that community. You need to find a community of people and then you do the two-way street. You check out someone else's game and they check out yours or you go to now, uh, there was a good question in the chat asking if there was unpub in Canada. And I'm not sure if there literally I, is unpub, find, quote unquote. I couldn't find unpub. Um, it's proto, I said proto TO is the big one yeah, in TO Southwestern one. Ontario. Like, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe you start up and talk to proto TO and see if they're willing to start up a local chapter in <laughs> Windsor proto uh, we we proto would have to be what it is for the our local branding we live in windsor essex so now everything's we something that started like i don't know about 10 20 years ago when the mayor pretended the super bowl was here when it was actually across the border everything became we so you'd have to have we proto would be the local community and see if you can get people to join it like i yes, i know you have your facebook group and you've got some interaction there but like do something formal and maybe be a subsector of proto to so that when pe people go to proto to it would point you to like, right. hey, if you're in Windsor, Emma Larkins is, yeah, Emma Larkins. That's exactly the group <laughs> I was go. thinking of in yep. Seattle. Emma's awesome. All right. Well, I think we. Mercury on Twitter. I think we covered that M's. pretty uh, pretty <laughs> thoroughly. So we're going to do a little, jump into a quick little one. Ryan asked, what is the oldest geek culture shirt you own and still wear? Oh, still wear is rough. I still have my Warhammer Fantasy Battle Skaven t-shirt that I mail ordered from GW UK, but there is no way that is fitting on this pod <laughs> whatsoever. I still own it. Still wear? I, I don't know. Most of my shirts are still in, in rotation, but they're not that old. Do, yeah, it's upstairs in the bottom drawer in the left-hand side. Uh, I think the oldest one I still wear is probably my no place. There's no place like 127.0.0.1. Um, yeah, that one's good. Uh, which isn't that old but oh no it's... no it's fairly the choose your weapon the green choose your weapon with the d6 to the d20 and then i have a blue one that's the same thing but it's controllers though it's really out of date now like i think it ends at xbox one like xbox not right. xbox one <laughs> like the original xbox controller and it shows like a pong controller and a tari one there you go where is a ban that... bandana no no you need the skaven to show up right that's the whole point is you got to see the skaven over top of each other if I don't have that one, then I have the one with the knight who's knocking the jaw off a skeleton, which was on the cover of the first edition Warhammer Fantasy Battle. It's right. either, I have that one or the Skaven one. I can, I'm pretty sure it's a Skaven one, but I might have the other one still. Um, but still wear is probably those, those Choose Your Weapon shirts, which go back to um, when uh, Jinx first opened. Right. Back when they had contests where you could win free shirts by sending in suggestions for shirts, and I sent yeah. them a ton. That's not where they came from, but I just I sent a bunch in hoping to get free shirts. Right. So I have that one, but that's... Um, I've got some anime ones that still might fit. Like, I have a Neon Genesis Evangelion shirt that may still fit, but I haven't tried. <laughs> um, it probably fit about a year ago. <laughs> yeah. The pandemic has been rough for people in many ways. That may have fit a year ago. Um, th th that's my final answer. Uh, I'll go with the, the choose your weapon shirts. I, I can still pull those off. <laughs> I got to kind of stretch them a bit before I wear them in public. All right. Well, we had some questions that came in earlier as well from some of our lobbyists in our uh, chat room on Discord. Yep. Jeff asked today, if you were a board game, which board game would you be? And he's, he's asking answer for answers from all three of us. That means you too, Angie Games. She, yep, she's actually paid. She's not doing something else right now. <laughs> so I was thinking, I saw this question earlier. I've been thinking about it. The, the answer is depressing. And I don't know if I want to share a depressing answer or not. So if you got something, go ahead. You know what? I've been struggling on, on this one. I, I haven't... Uh... I keep every once in a while, I keep coming up with uh, silly, funny, funny answers, but a real honest answer. I a silly, funny really answer know. might be good. The problem is my real honest answer is like self-degrading and I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't break into tears while telling it because that's all I can come up with. So I was thinking I'm Splendor. 
see because when people first meet me they're like oh my god this guy's awesome and he's got all these board games and he's really cool and he knows all this stuff or i'm thinking about when i start a new job they're like wow this kid must have been gifted he's picking up things and getting on things twice as quick as everyone else but then like i'm not diagnosed with any of this but i swear i'm somewhere on the spectrum and my brain doesn't work quite right and then once these people accept me i then become too much i push things too far i i don't stop I just keep giving them more and more, or I get too deeply involved, or I take things too seriously, or whatever it is. And those people that initially love me are just kind of like, nah, I've had a bit much of Mo. Like it was great at first, but he's pushing a little too hard and he's a little too close, or he's a little too in my face, or he won't shut up about a thing, or he keeps showing up when he's not invited, or just a little too much of him. And for that reason, I think I'm Splendor. Because when I got Splendor, I'm like, man, this game is awesome. Look at it. It's like this. And then you play it enough times, you're kind of like, well, okay, yeah, I get it. I've, I've seen all the things you can do. This game's okay. Why does everyone else want to keep playing it? And then the more I play it, the more I'm just kind of like, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of sick of Splendor. And every game night I go to, there's someone who want to play Splendor. And then I go on here and they're like, oh, Splendor. And I'm here and today. Splendor's on Board Game Arena. I'm like, oh, enough with the Splendor. So yeah, I think I'm Splendor. See, me, I think I'm Gloomhaven. Because I'm massively overweight, very complex, but nobody really knows what to do with it all once you get it out. I like that. That's pretty good. I'm working on the overweight thing again. Started working out again. I'm down a bit. Still waiting on Deanna's answer then. Yep. Yep. I got nothing. How can I follow that up? <laughs> all right. But apparently, I apparently I broke D. So show that does not have manual decks. What game is that? I'm like. You're a which way novel. There we go. <laughs> choose choose your own adventure board game. A choose choose your own adventure game. A so legacy dragon hole played solo. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, now I'm even more inside. No one disputed me being Splendor, so now I know I'm <laughs> Splendor, and I'm probably pushing them too close, and I'm getting too close, and they're gonna have to push me away soon. Luckily, on the show, they can always just tune out on the week's. Day. That is true. I didn't realize I get such <laughs> we, deep and destructive answers. Yeah. That's um, the problem with it happening before I took a shower. That's right, literally the problem is I was taking a shower and that's what was running through my head. And I kept thinking about it and thinking about it. And I'm like, oh, I'm this, no, I'm this, no. I'm like, I'm Talisman second edition with all the expansions, <laughs> but missing a couple of the metal miniatures because I know so much stuff and there's just so much going on in the box, but it's all kind of nostalgia and it's all old stuff and it's kind of irrelevant nowadays. But <laughs> So I was kind of leaning towards that one for a while until I came up with the Splendor analogy. I figured oh. Sean had to say he was Candyland but, oh, and, and figure out how he was going to tie the two together. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see if D comes up with an answer before we're done the show. We're going to jump over now to a question earlier from earlier on where from math guy, Dave, who's in the chat room. Uh, what are the main barriers keeping you from playing RPGs online? Mostly for you. Cause well, I do play online some. At time commitment, time and commitment. That's, that's all it is. And, and pl I'll admit, I don't like playing online nearly as much as I like playing in person. I, I, I need that physical connection. I need to be able to look people in the eye. I need to see body language to really enjoy an RPG. And like we tried it on Discord and it worked, right? Like Math Guy Day played in the game I ran and it worked well enough and I had a good time. Um, so I don't know, again, I'm gonna get philosophical here, I guess. For one, it's a first step. It's taking that first step. It's one of those, you know, you're gonna enjoy the thing but you still don't wanna do it. And then once you do it, you love it which for me was when I was a kid, it was scouts. I hated going to scouts. I didn't want to go to scouts. I pretend I got hurt or I, you know, whatever, pretend I'm sick. So I didn't want to go to scouts, but then my parents would drop me off at scouts and I would have a great time. They picked me up and I'd be like, it was awesome. But then next week it'd be like, Oh, I don't want to go to scouts. I hate scouts. It's that there's that aspect. There's that taking that first step to actually do it, but more so like, I don't, I, how am I, many weeks in a row now have I said, I'm going to do unboxing videos and I haven't gotten those in and how many times I'm like, I'm going to do RPG a month and I'm going to read one role playing game a month and do a review. And I said it after reviewing white star, I'm like, Oh, that was awesome. I loved reviewing white star. I need to do another one. I haven't done that. And it's not just like procrastination. It's just with what we do, doing this a full time and nothing being steady, right? We don't have any steady income. We're always got the next thing to do. There's always one more thing. There's always one more deal to share. There's always, I should be creating more pins on Pinterest to try to drive more web tra traffic, or I should be going back to our most popular posts and rewriting them and updating them, make sure the links are good. Like there's just always something to do. And then I push myself to the point where I'm so sick of it that I just, I'm out of spoons. I don't want to do anything. 
and I end up on the couch watching Netflix, right? Like we're working our way through, we're doing about three episodes of Deep Space Nine a night right now. For a while for me, that escape was Animal Crossing, but I haven't played that in 14 days. So right now I'm off that kick. Um, I had started Zelda Breath of the Wild, but I found it too stressful because it's just, it's, it's Zelda, it's difficult. So that wasn't a good one. One of the things I would honestly kind of love to do, uh, and it would take unfortunately the right group as well as other things, uh, but you love playing the game. Like you love running games. Yeah. Um, you really enjoy running games, but you don't want to have to deal with the fiddling and you don't even want to really have to learn the fiddling setups that come with mm-hmm. online. Right. Yes. So you, you, again, you like miniature games, you mm-hmm. like miniatures in your RPGs uh, and all that stuff is available, but you've got oh, the learning curve, the learning yeah. curve to deal with. What I think would work for us is um, and I keep considering it. I, I, I have my finger has been hovering over the buy foundry button far too many times in the past <laughs> few months. But like literally, I set up a game for you to run for people. Like I'm your I'm your yeah. producer for an RPG, um, and it wouldn't even have to. I mean, we don't even have to do Twitch. I mean, we don't have to do live stream. That's a whole other level of production that we don't necessarily yeah, want to get into. Plus, there's there's content issues. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like, like like I can sit down with the people at the table and we can do session zero and decide exactly what we want to hear. But that may not be what the viewers are comfortable with. That's like I, I I applaud anyone who live streams their RPGs and doesn't get in trouble. Yeah, right? no. <laughs> like, like things come out during games and absolutely i there i i, like, I, I, would I, I don't know i'm, I'm amazed like even critical roles get called on it they made the small mistakes now and then right i i would have a hard time putting myself out there on a and a on a twitch rpg because i know my some of my content goes blue and yeah. you know and and i have some unfortunately social 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 racism aspects of me that i know are there and i have been working hard to get mm-hmm. out but they come out things, now things come out right you know yeah. phrases that i learned as a kid and were drilled into me that i have since learned are, are really bad but again it's one of those things where i grew up saying that and had no idea what i was I'm saying i'm not laughing at sean noting racist i'm just laughing at how deep we keep going like like this is the like deep ama <laughs> this week the, the soul yeah, searching, soul searching AMA. ama but yeah, I think I think the the way we could best do it online would be all right. So Sundays from eight until midnight, we're gonna role play. Mo, this is the you know death on the reek we're running, and yep. it will be set up for you when you sit down at the uh, yeah, at yeah. the computer, and all you have to do is run it, and you know everyone will have characters, and everyone will uh, have maybe. miniatures, and be able we'll all be able to see it and do it. And I wouldn't be playing. And that would be what's hardest for me is because I well, want to yeah. play in one of your games. You'd think again. you could play too, though. But well, N- no, nowadays, cause... hidden information isn't what it used to be. Well, it True. is if people take it seriously that True. way. But something that things I used to worry about, we wouldn't worry about. Yeah. So Jeff's noting a lot of streamers do the X card lines and veils. The thing is, you haven't done that with your audience. Right. And that's what I don't like about live streaming game. I play Warhammer and I'm really into the realms of chaos and I have slaves to darkness. And if I start using that content, that will offend some. There's a lot of body horror, even just, exactly. just body horror alone. That's in, like in I the... said, the body horror <laughs> that is describing the chaos waste and the chaos beastmen's and there are, there are things that I am certain could easily offend a viewer. And if they don't know that's coming, Right. I'm just as guilty as like, and, and the problem know, it, it'd be hard. Like, yes, you can list all the content yeah. warnings you want, but that's what I would be worried about. And the problem with Twitch is a lot. I mean, it's really easy to sit down and at the start of your session, to have a, have a warning, you know, Hey, here's what we're doing this week. Here's our trigger warnings. This is what we're doing. Please but you don't, aware. if you're but playing then, to discover what happens, in, someone can jump in yeah. to your show and they don't necessarily have that context anymore. It's not tough. even that too, but like when you start a session, you don't know what's going to happen. Right. Like unless you pre-record, but like do we live on Twitch? Yeah, I can put out all the court content warnings in their thought, but then I didn't think Huge was going to pull corn out his butt. And people who play Warhammer might know what that means, but like <laughs> suddenly goes yep. you know over the yep. top with some torture porn or something because yep. that was an aspect that if you got the God Slanish there, that's an aspect of the game. Yeah, you can record and edit for YouTube, not streaming it. I don't know. I, I don't plan on doing any live stream RPGs. Yeah. No, but I, as for playing online, like I said, time is the biggest. Like just for like and a big part of that is learning the tools. Like 
even the one game we did run still like I spent four hours I think at least just trying to do what I did do in roll 20 which was just a matter of creating player tokens and I think we spent half an hour in game trying to figure out how to put plus one minus one to track how many bennies we had or whatever they were called in that game yeah so yeah the, the biggest thing that gets in the way is is one time to play two commitment right like one shot's one thing uh, as it is, like we we're supposed to play a, a Star Wars online game on Thursdays, and I don't remember the last time we played it. Thankfully, it's three people who are four people who are very blasé about it anyway, except for the fact that I should have never paid for a subscription and neither should, <laughs> should have D, but that going, like we can't even keep that going, right? Or heck, we didn't record our podcast last week, right? There's a commitment signing up for a game, either, either as a player or a GM. And it's not the kind of thing like where a player's house where if, well, if one player doesn't show up, you just play. Well, if the DM doesn't show up, you get another dm it's a little more difficult when it's when it, if i'm the one running roller or sean's doing the producer thing if i can't run we're out right like i can't have a backup gm for something like that all right so we've uh dug into that pretty seriously i think yeah again <laughs> we got any right. more deep questions <laughs> we got a question here from roger so now that we know which game you want to be what are your greatest pet peeves? What drives you nuts at a game table? Uh, the biggest is people not paying attention. If you're playing a serious game, like if you're playing Sushi Go and Seven Wonders and you know it's a beer and pretzel, everyone's having beers and someone's not paying attention, that's different. But if you're all sitting down to play Terraforming Mars and everyone's expecting you to play Terraforming Mars for three to four hours or however long it takes, and someone's it, it could be their phone it could be looking around the room it could be we're at easy mode and they're watching some live stream of someone playing uh at Fortnite, or it could be getting up to get a drink and it, the the time when it gets to a player's turn and for one you have to remind them hey it's your turn and then they go oh, okay wait what's going on what happened since my last turn and they have no clue what they're doing they haven't pre-planned and yes i know some games that table state will change in between rounds enough that you can't plan ahead but most games you can usually be two or three turns ahead at least one turn ahead knowing where you're going to do stuff so to me it's it's that lack of attention and it drives me the absolute worst when it's i'm teaching the game and and i teach them the rules and there's someone not paying attention and i can tell they're not paying attention so i'm like well so you got that sean so blah 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 and then we start playing mm -hmm. and the first question is oh wait how's this work and I'm just like, ooh. So for me, yeah, it's it's that. Um, now, Deanna has pointed out it's quarterbacking. She hates when anyone else tells her how to play. There, There is, we bought a game. She made me buy a game because some grognard at a con tried to make, take her turn for her through the entire game. And she made me buy it so we should bring it home so that she could play it herself without someone telling her what to do. And I'll admit, I think we played it once since then. So it probably wasn't a very good purchase. But because this old white dude with a huge beard let everyone else take their turn, but because it was a woman at the table, had to, oh, no, dearie, you want to do this. And, oh, no, you wanted to do this. No, no, you don't want to do that. And I'm like, here's the probably the best player at the table. And he's trying to coach her on how to play. Yeah, no, that's, that's and that's a, not even just a D problem. That's a female gamer problem yeah. i'm sure for many many women at yeah the, so deanna uh, deanna clarified so there was someone trying to correct me when i make my move particularly if it's coming from a certain angle demographic which i was a little more specific yeah no absolutely uh you know what honestly i don't i don't know um i think you i thought you didn't like the super competitive players well yeah that there's that but I, that that's i mean yeah no i guess that's true uh, you know, if you're if you're there to like the, be the super, best, you know, I'm gonna I have to win a game. I and you know, who get mad if you cut them off? Yeah, and... yeah, I have to I have to know the best strategy, and I ha yeah that that just yeah no I, that that's right yep <laughs> I can't like there there is a local gamer who actually reached out to me again who I banned from our events who I'm worrying I'm gonna have to reban once things get up, and I actually said please don't contact me again. Um, who was so serious about his games? What he would do was convince other players to play badly right? just so they could win. But all in the, the he's just giving friendly advice and he knows the game better than me. So people would listen to him and he would literally give bad advice 
Like he would just say, no, no, you'd be better moving your army there. No, no, if you do just do that, and if you just do that, that'll give you 30 coins. And then you'd be like, then you do it. And they'd be like, ha, ha, ha. And then just go in and like tear you apart. And I'm like, right. no, you're metagaming. You're not winning the game because you're better at the game. You're winning the game because you're manipulating the players. Right. And it's not a social deduction game where you're supposed to manipulate the players, right? This wasn't power grid, right? They got my dad to actually get eliminated from the game in the beginning on purpose. He's like, no, if you spend all your money now, you'll get the better plant than everyone else. And my dad was out for the whole game and hated it. Even that was the one time I saw my dad get mad at one of our events. And I'm like, no, that, that is terrible. So yeah, but the, but the not paying attention for me, but like, I also, I'm not a big fan of the over, if you're playing a tournament, sure. Right. Yeah, like if, it's, if there's something on the line <laughs> besides you're just playing for fun. Yeah, sure. But other than that, we're all here to sit and play a game and have fun. Yeah, and I know, I'll admit, I, I take some games reason. too seriously. I do. It can happen. I can be that person. You you can at times, but generally, I mean, most of the games we play, are, we're, we're still learning. So, mm -hmm. so we don't have that problem because we're just trying to figure it all out. Um, the, the, I think the, the most funny time I've ever seen you get that way was at the uh, FLGS playing Bean. Uh, and 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 you were super into the game and no one else was. Yeah, everyone else was just like throwing no, Everyone cards. else was just playing cards and having fun and having a chat. And you were so frustrated and so angry because you were going to win. You had the right strategy. You had the right and, and I'm like, no, oh, why you did you give him that to card? Win, and we all just didn't care. And I mean, and it wasn't that I was trying not to care, but at the same time, the rest of the table hadn't cared. And it was very obvious that you were going to play Bean. Yep. Not just not just, you know, chat and have coffee and and and, chat and uh, goof around. So Ryan notes it's hard to be able to call someone on not paying attention when you can't see it, which is true. Absolutely. That, that's very true. Which is one of the things I don't like about online gaming. Yep. Uh, no, and that's one of the pro big problems I have with online gaming without video. Uh because again, I do, I do not quite play by post, but you know, just straight text and you never know when it's like, oh, you know, all of a sudden you've been waiting on someone's response. And they're like, oh, sorry, I got called away. I had to go, you know, take garbage out. Yeah, or something. exactly. And you don't know, like, you don't know if you should be working on another thread in the story or if you really should be waiting for person X to take their turn because you don't have that visual cues. And that's one of the, the, the really valuable aspects of the video. Um, even mm -hmm. though like in meetings, I, I hate doing video on Zoom meetings. Most of the meetings I do, thankfully, uh, we don't. But uh, it's it's one of those frustrations. It's like I don't. I want to. I want to know when people are paying attention. No, makes sense. Alrighty. Uh, All right, we got time for at least one more, or we could dive into this bottom thing. Uh, you know what? Probably no, wrap let's... up with that. But I'm thinking we're, we're going to save this for next week. Yep. Yep. All right. So one of the things we thought about talking to, about tonight was what makes a train game. But I, that may be our entire topic next week, because the more Sean and I were discussing it before the show, the more we were thinking, this could be bigger, right? Th this this could take some time. And I'm thinking we might do it completely unscripted and just have me and Sean shoot the the, the stuff back and forth <laughs> about train games. So An I think we're both on the same episode. page. Yep. What we needed, we need is someone who's a train game fan to come on and argue with us the the other side i think yeah, is what need... what'll be missing from that or, or maybe i'll just take the devil's advocate side and just start disagreeing yeah <laughs> i i would be probably better off just agreeing but we do still have some questions from the chat or received earlier from people in the chat so that still counts absolutely so i'm gonna go with uh back to a uh jeff oh we actually you know what roger's got a game that just popped up and i'm gonna go with that you like that one better all, all right. right i'm gonna i'm gonna go with that. we're saving jeff's for next month yeah, or yeah. next Absolutely. week or whatever Jeff's, we just got some one. great questions we can use later so i want to throw this one because this is straight live from the chat room roger okay. asks does anyone take the time to really master a game anymore the games change so often how can a person even do this what games are we missing out on which might take a while to really get a hang of. And, you know, we talk about this whole one and done mm -hmm. gaming system all the time. So, yeah, this is definitely a thing. A thing with modern board games. This was not a big deal back in the year 2000 when games like Catan and like you could get 
the top 10 games and play them all. And they were the top for a reason. Like they really were like you could, uh, Tom Vassell used to say it. Well, he said back in the day when he started his podcast and his, his show where he, he was a vlog first, a YouTube vlog, he used to be able to play every hobby game that was released every year. Like, yes, he probably missed some small independent publishers, but in general, he would get to play every game that was released and he would highlight the best of them. Now that's impossible. Like, Literally, there are not enough hours in a year to play every game that was published. It's just you can't do it. And that's in one year. So every year you're missing out on something. And then the next year you're missing out on more. And the pile of games you didn't get to play just grows and grows. It's definitely a thing. Now, what I will say, though, is there are people out there that master games, that sit there and master them. And this kind of goes to the train game topic is most of the people who listen to gaming podcasts are looking for a variety of views so they probably play a variety of games so most of us i'm going to use that term (laughs) are more of the new hotness try new games always play new games but there are people out there that still just play one game or a small handful of games or one system and there's definitely sub genres of gaming that stick to one type of game and the biggest of that are the chit hex encounter war gamers and historical miniature gamers to throw in um brian sheehan who's not with us tonight but to give him a shout out and the um train gamers right like looking at the 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 18xx like the heavy economic train gamers those are definitely subsets where that's all those people do and they love them and they play every 18xx that comes out and they'll get one with the difference because you can sell the stock one round sooner in this game and how much that changes the overall feel of the game there are people that deep dive games that much it's just not us now deanna is someone who would deep dive games more she loves playing the same game over and over and over and really mastering a game and we do do a lot of that but now it's online like I would say at this point, we have deep dive Terra Mystica about as far as it can go. Like the only thing we should do now is get someone new in there just to mess with what we've been seeing in the last few games because that would totally change our strategy. I've now played every race in that game at least once, if not twice or three times at this point. I have favorites now. I want to get the expansion because that, that's not online, but I'd love to play with the expansion, see what that changes. Another example is Eminent Domain. Uh, we've talked about it on the show where that's a game that honestly, I think can be bad your first play and not so great your second play. But then once you played it four or five times, you start to learn how the decks work and what the tech are, then you can really enjoy the game. And the game's not good until you get to that point. So, and and like, I know people who played Puerto Rico a hundred times. I played Race for the Galaxy 150 times. I, I definitely have deep dove that, except eric who keeps saying if the games keeps picking random expansions and i never know which one's in and which one's not and that's just me not spending enough time to figure out which ones are in which game but um, i definitely don't win every time so it it happens there are people who take the time to master a game and i admit now and then i miss it like i i miss the like when i got back into hobby gaming Catan was the game we at the time Uh, We had an apartment in the west end of town. My parents lived in the west end of town and they were Canadian snowbirds and they would go down to Texas and we didn't house it, but we checked in on the house at least once a week. And what we do is we would go over there on the weekend and spend the night. And at some point in there, I got game magazine which used to be published. I loved it. It was a magazine that was mostly crossword puzzles and stuff like that and logic puzzles and that. But they also had a section on video games and board games. And they would give out a Games 100 uh, top games of the year. And I went there and went, you know what? I'm going to take this magazine and whatever wins the number one spot, I'm going to go buy. And then I looked and it was Catan. And then I called Ian at Hugan Immune. I'm like, do you have this game, Catan? He's like, yeah, I got that game, Catan. And at that time, it hasn't quite blown up. Like, this was just on the cusp of it blowing up. So we went there and we bought Catan. And we brought it home and we played it. And we drank a lot of beer. And we played it, I think, seven times in a row till about five in the morning. Then the next Saturday, we're like, hey, Ian, are there expansions for Catan? He's like, oh, yeah, sure enough. So then we got, I think it was Seafarers first. And then we played, I don't know how many times. Yeah, and we didn't know Ian. Ian wasn't like a friend at that point. He was just the guy that owned the local game store. And then I don't know how many times we played. Like, we we also drank a lot of beer because it was hanging out with Sean Skolak. Not Sean from... Oh, wait, that doesn't work. This is a whole other show. <laughs> Yet I another of the collected Sean's. 
yes i collect sean's and it would get so bad like we'd be so drunk that i would put cards on my forehead so i'd remember that i want to trade it the next turn but then i'd forget it and it'd be there between games and we'd be like two games later and i'd still have a weed on my head like it, it but we had so much fun and then the sister who actually isn't in the chat tonight um started joining us and then the group grew and then we got the five to six player expansions and like i don't know how many we probably played 300 games of Catan that summer or that winter, I guess it would have been that winter. And like we deep dived it and it was so fun. Like, like everyone knew everyone else's strategy and you knew, yeah, uh, <laughs> you didn't have to worry about Skolak. You just like, he'll go pick somewhere in the corner. You could ignore him, cut D off before she's able to just buy every stupid, um, what are they called? I can't remember what those cards are called. Development cards. Don't let Deanna get the spot where she just keeps buying development cards. And we all had counter plays to play against each other. It was definitely a thing. So it happens. And like, we've done it. But like, there are certain games I play and I'm like, this needs to be deep dived. Like eminent domain was one and I did it. Like we, we still didn't deep, deep, deep dive it. We gave that more plays than any other game just for the review purposes. And it happens, but it, it's as rare. There is um, Highlander in Windsor who Sean made me remember for the BBS days. His group still plays Catan. They came out to one night at the Knights of Columbus and I taught him to play Catan and he gave me the biggest handshake ever for introducing him to something new. And then they never showed up again. And then I found out basically what he did was we taught him the game. And then he took that game back to his group that used to meet on Sundays in his backyard in his garage with folding tables. And they were all playing Catan. They still have Catan. Well, I don't know with COVID. As far as I know, that group still has Catan night. And that's what they do. They love Catan. You see this a lot more with role-playing games, uh, especially D&D. Uh, much to Jeff's chagrin, where people play one system and play it to death. And I'll admit, we were like that. We did that with Warhammer. We weren't interested in playing anything else for a long time. And then we eventually spread out. But even then, we were still like kind of stuck to the same D100-based systems. Like we played Chill, we played TSR Marvel, but you didn't play that. That was before then. Um, Warhammer, um, Cyberpunk 2020, which was D10-based. We tend to do D10 and D100 games more than D20 games. But we played those same games over and over. And meanwhile, there were new RPGs being released all the time. But we just know I don't need a new role playing game. I got D&D or I got or AD&D second edition or I've got Cyberpunk or I got Warhammer. So the people are out there, but there's definitely a big push for the new hotness, play the new hotness. And that's for content creators for sure. And we ignore it. <laughs> we don't really pay, pay attention to the new hotness unless someone contacts me and says, hey, do you want to review the new hotness? And then we review it. Or when I happen to attend a con and a virtual con nowadays and hear about the new hotness, I'll talk about it. But it's definitely not something you would do as often. One of the things I see, uh, and I see it on the side because it's not something I do. I'm not the guy who's going to master a game. I am not going to sit down and even games I've played to death. Um, you know, I play... Like, what was uh go sushi sushi go i've played i don't even know how many hundreds of games of now yeah um that one i feel like i've i've mastered because there's such a random aspect of it but i feel pretty confident that if the right things come up i'm gonna be in the top two players if the right cards don't come up you know i lose yeah whatever doesn't matter um uh you know i, I feel like i'm getting better at uh gt racing terra mystica mm -hmm. i still don't feel like i'm that confident with. but then again <laughs> i don't sit and analyze it as much i a lot of the playing i do is i do a lot of gut instinct playing which probably mm -hmm. drives mo uh, d in particular crazy more often than not yeah most but of the time i don't even pay attention to who's playing what color <laughs> I, I i that's one problem i found playing online is i focus on my own stuff only i'm not good at watching what other people right. are doing uh, but uh no the tournaments on board game arena there are some serious tournaments. And I mean, I look at some of the people who play in uh, board game arena. Hope that way. <laughs> and, um, sorry. sorry. Uh, look, you look, there's these major tournaments that happen on board game arena uh, where people take it really seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and there are people with like really high ratings of, of all on the games and things like that. And I look at these people and I'm like, my my good game ratings are like 200 250 yeah and you look at some of these people that are like 1300 mm -hmm. i'm like well okay you play that game a lot and, and really focus on it i'm not that interested in doing that but uh but they're there and those are mm -hmm. the people who are in there the other thing too is i honestly think game design has changed to be more ephemeral 
the games that are coming out now are lighter, quicker to the table, more replayable due to randomness to make them interesting instead of longer complex strategies. Now, those other games still come out, right? You still get your Anachronies, you still have your Terra Mysticas, you have your Twilight Imperiums, but the average popular board game nowadays, like Wingspan is a perfect example, is a pretty light game that there isn't anything to deep dive. Like, like the first time you play, you've kind of experienced everything. And yes, you might get better at it, but like there's nothing to play 50 times to learn a new strategy. Uh, same with like Azul, even no matter how much we love Azul, like once you got it, you kind of got it. Like there's 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 nothing much to deep dive. It's not like chess where you're going to be figuring out strategies for hundreds of years. It, it's not, it's just the meat's not there. Now, again, that's where you get those other subsectors of games, right? There are those games out there. There's the 18XXs, there's the the GMT games, any, pretty much anything published by GMT games you can deep dive. But again, what we call those is lifestyle games. So a game that you are going to deep dive, we call a lifestyle game, and you end up playing that instead of other games for a significant portion of your life. Gloomhaven, I would say, is a lifestyle game just by how many scenarios are in it. Yep. And while we played pretty casually playing Fridays most of the time, there are people out there that managed to finish Gloomhaven in six months. And I'm just like, how many times a week did you play? How many sessions in a row did you play? Like, did you go through three missions a night? Like, I can't imagine doing that. <laughs> and that was back when I was gaming more often. But yeah, I mean, so I'm it, looking right now, there are like 15 different tournaments open right now on BGA. Yeah, so whether, you want, whether you want to play those. Kark or Hive or Innovation or Race for the Galaxy, uh, actually, there's Rallyman GT tournament. I may there actually you go. click on. You might have to jump but, in. Uh, I got I got to check on the on the dates on that one. But uh, yeah, there's a ton of stuff. Yeah, Rogers. There. Roger just pointed out a good one. It was his question. Hiroshima Hex. That is definitely a game you could deep dive especially the idiosyncrasies from the different armies. Unfortunately for me, I have a copy of the game. Deanna hates it. And I don't know what she doesn't like about it. Usually she likes abstract strategies, but that one, for whatever reason, just didn't click for her. She didn't enjoy it. So I had never gotten to deep dive it. Like I, I really dig the game, but it's mainly a two player game. And the person I play two player games with is sitting over there. So, <laughs> all right, before we get to another question, is Deanna decide what game she is yet? Oh, I didn't think I was still on the hot seat for that one. <laughs> <laughs> we were giving you some time all right we're gonna do one more i think i don't know how many questions we've answered this is gonna be hard to seo <laughs> uh, we got some good deep talks about a few things and then some things that i'm not gonna bother seoing like what game are you <laughs> uh do we have anything that's good okay well let's, let's there let's was do... something i saw in the chat and I'm, i lost oh, it now. I miss one do i need a digital camera so yeah so may is in the chat and said playing games and drinking and taking photos of games nothing like getting film developed and trying to figure out why i felt the need to drunkenly take photos of dice so so many photos of dice <laughs> yeah the days before cell phone cameras yep. so uh jeff's knowing if i played dominion there are certain combination of cards i won't play and i'll get it that's what it was someone said something about if you solve the game yeah if you have solved the game it's not fun to win anymore with that solution so uh, yeah the, the question was if you find a dominant strategy i trounce someone and then i purposely never use it again so no, if you've solved the before, game yeah. it's not fun to win anymore with that solution so uh, I heard, I, the thing game. is a good game a game that you can deep dive can't be solved right right like Catan, there's no winning strategy it's very much based on what the other players do like yes there are certain strategies that work really well but there are counters to all of those and yes deanna's in particular strategy will tend to win any tournament she enters because people don't know to stop it but if you know to stop it you can stop it and there are other strategies that technically could work better if she doesn't stop them and that's a good game it's that interplay knowing the other players you're playing with and if you don't man playing Catan in a tournament is hard because you don't know what the other players are doing. Now, most of the tournaments you enter tend to have casual players. And that's where it's like, all right, no problem. I should be able to win this. Unless you get someone at the table who decides to do that. Well, no trading with Mo for the rest of the game. And then you're like, well, I can't win because the table decided I can't win. Right. And that's king making. And some people hate it. Some people don't mind it and whatever. But that's an aspect of it. But I think like Puerto Rico, everyone's told me Puerto Rico solved. I still don't see it myself, but I never deep dive that game to that level. And no, I've never Googled what that strategy is. All I know in that is that it's very much like blackjack, where depending on where you're sitting at the table, you're supposed to do certain things. And if you don't, you hand the game to the player on your left or right. I don't remember what it is. Every time I sat down at a table and someone said that to me, that player didn't win or I won. Like it's either I won or someone else that shouldn't have won one and then they still blame it on me because i didn't do the thing like i 
I don't know. So supposedly that's solved. And then again, the newest edition actually comes with the new buildings and that supposedly fixes that strategy. Um, people have told me that there's a winning strategy for Princess of Florence. Um, tonight, again, we're going to go to tonight's review. I think I found a loophole. I'm not positive, but we chose not to use it. Like we sat there and went, this isn't thematic. It doesn't really make sense. So I think we're going we're gonna to not use this strategy, but I still think it's something that breaks the game, which we'll get to in the review segment. But it's yeah. definitely something. Yeah, for, for me, I mean, if there's a, this game, this is going to win the game, I'm probably not going to play that game anymore. I, I just, why? It's not a game anymore. It's a, it's a puzzle. Yeah, it's a right? solved puzzle. It's, it, you know, puzzles, puzzles with, with solutions aren't, you, you don't want to do this crossword after someone has lightly erased all the answers already. You know, it's, yeah. there's no fun there. Uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely, I'll admit, like, a, there's a couple games, I'm, I can't think of any, maybe Deanna can that we own where we basically don't play them anymore because of that, that there's, there's certain ways to play that just seem better. Yep. All right. Oh, Descent Journeys in the Dark. That was a play it all the time game. I like Hive. Hive's a good game. Hive tournament would be rough. I'm really good at Hive, but <laughs> I don't know if I'd be good enough for a, <laughs> for a tournament. Do we have anything light to answer? Because we're still a little short on time. We haven't even spent an hour talking here. All right. Well, well sure. Let's. Uh, Jeff's got another one here. That's a. That I think is something one. really that that one. I don't think is all that light. No. <laughs> no. Okay. I'm thinking like just something silly. Do we have anything silly? Someone's asked. Uh... Just to kill a few more minutes. Yeah, Deanna's noting she's a Terra Mystica pro at this point for the number of <laughs> games she's played. Uh... I still think I did really well with the bridge people, but it didn't do it for me. Well, you know, it happens. It, yes, it's my fault. We don't have Canadian merch. I need to set the time aside to do a video video call with someone uh, okay. that may produce our stuff, but I need to be feeling better to do that. Right. Uh, Machi Koro, I did not like much. If Roger had turned into the last couple shows, I, I <laughs> talked about it in the um, games we played. Just did not impress me. Well, not compared to some other games that do things similar. So yeah, Roger, add to your list, play Space Base with Mo, and then we'll see if you still like Machi Koro. <laughs> uh, one thing Dee's noting is uh, when she plays Terra Mystica, she refuses to play certain races, and I'm guessing Witches is probably one of them, uh, because those are the beginner races, right? Those are designed yep. to be Yeah, the Witches, the weight. Desert Nomads, and the Darklings, is it? Um, something like that. But yeah, so yeah. There, are, there are beginner races that are designed to be a little easier to play and have a little extra advantage so that, you know, the people who've been playing a while can help, can hop on and play the giants. Whereas the new player can get the witches and, and have a little right. easier time and yeah. not get quite as frustrated as quickly. Wow, the witches are just ridiculous. In yeah, it's, uh, I, 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 there's gotta be a counter to them and I haven't figured out what it was. See Machi Koro, the original game has a dominant strategy, but it's fixed with Harbor. And if you pick up Bright Lights, Big City, which is the addition I have, it's also fixed in that. Bright Lights, Big City is a combination of the best of the expansions put together. And now the Machi Koro fifth edition anniversary edition is now out. That also fixes that dominant strategy. What I didn't like in Machi Koro is it was, it was too much take that and it was too much passing around to resources. And it was just frustrating. It's like, I can build it. No, you took all my money. Hey, look, I can build. Oh, you took all my money. Oh, look, well, I might as well just build this crappy stuff. So at least you don't steal my money. And then you end up with this table full of stuff and it gets convoluted. I was not a big fan of that one. It's interesting. There are a lot of uh, Machikoro strategy guides out there. It's yes. like Monopoly, right? It's one of those games where everyone has their ways to better to to the base the game, game did often. have a broken strategy that was pretty well documented by a bunch of gamers which is why i stayed away from it for so long right so all right here's our last question uh first i'll note tech finally got to play space base and his daughter loved it too that's awesome space base is really good i'm still upset like, I really good <laughs> i i am really look i've only played a two player i am really looking playing that with more i still don't think it replaces valeria card kingdoms well, we have a answer from D for our "What type of game are you?" episode. D is Seafall. Okay, it's a legacy game with a which way book with rules that change and develop in complexity the longer you know her. And Seafall, because it's not popular, most people overlook it, and it ends up in the discount bin. <laughs> the discount bin part's a little rough. <laughs> well, we were pretty rough on both of yeah, ours as well. That's so true. There we go. The rest, no, totally fair. I, I like it. 
a text pointing out that he had three players in his uh, space base. So he's played. Nice. I, I assume it's got to be better because just more things would happen on the off turn. Well, we had with two players. It's just back I and forth. Even went through the rules. <laughs> Somehow Very we close. skipped playing it. I don't know. Well, the one time we like it was there on the table I buried. Not, <laughs> not that letter jam was bad. It's yeah. just we didn't see the game. It wasn't in front of our face. Yep. All right. Well, that's all for our rainy day AMA. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop. Today, we're going to take a look at the third Robotech game from Solar Flare Games, Invid Invasion. Mm -hmm. Before we begin, we do have to thank Solar Flare Games for sending us review copies of all the games in this series. A Robotech Invid Invasion was designed by Dave Killingsworth and features art from Andorra, Sidonia, and Joel Lopez. It was published by Solar Flare Games in 2020, right in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think due to that, really didn't get the exposure it deserves. Like if you look at the Board Game Geek page on this, just like no one owns it, no one's reviewed it, no one's talking about it. Now, Invid Invasion plays one to six players, with the games we played taking two to three hours each. This is this Robotech-themed game has an MSRP of $50 US. This is the third Robotech game from Solar Flare. Check out our backlog or the blog for reviews of the other two games, Robotech Force of Arms and Robotech Crisis Point. Now, in Robotech Invid Invasions, players take on the roles of four to six Robotech Freedom Fighters from the Robotech The Next Generation series. That was the third series, as well as this being the third game. Now, this game is split into two halves, with the first half having you try to break through the Invid lines and get to Reflex Point. Now, players do this by fighting through a grid of cards to try to create a path from east to west before time runs out. Now, assuming you're able to get to reflex points, you then take on the Invid Regis and her defenders and need to take her out before the expeditionary force has no other choice but to destroy the entire planet to stop the Invid, you included. While playing the game, players will find gear and protoculture, which will enable them to swap mecha in order to improve their odds in battling the Invid. Now, this is the third Robotech game from Solar Flare, and this set of games were created as a series where each successive game would be more involved and more difficult, culminating in Invid Invasion, which we're looking at today. Now, each of the games looks at a different Robotech series. Force of Arms was set in the Macross saga, Crisis Point is during the Robotech Masters series, and Invid Invasion lets you play through the new generation. Now, Dave, the designer of all three games, noted that they wanted to sit down and create a series of games that you could sit down for one epic game night and play through the entire Robotech series. And epic game night would be required as the time for these games ramps up with the difficulty. So even if you've played this before, you're looking at a decent time investment. And yeah. if it's your first time through, all bets are off. Yeah, I got to admit, we, we took pictures and we were doing other social media things while we were playing. So we probably waste a little time, but we were over four hours for our first game. And that's only with two players. If there were six of us debating what to do each turn, it would have been way longer. Now, another thing that's grown with each game in this series from Force of Arms to this one is the box size and the sheer amount of stuff you get with each game. For a good look at just how big the box is for this game, and to see what you get in that box in detail, be sure to check out our Robotech Invid Invasion unboxing video on YouTube. Now, overall, regarding the components, I would say quality is good. Not great, but not bad either. Just good. Now, the board is huge. This is the reason for the rather large size box. Now, it's not overly deep, but it is a rather large size. Um, and the board is a six-fold. Like, this is, this is a bit of a table hop. Now, there are also a huge number of cardboard standees. It's sub above 20, I think, possibly over 30 standees. Um, these did punch well, but the actual small little half circle stands that you have to attach to them did give us some trouble, especially with the little notch in the middle trying to get it out. And it also gave us a bit of a problem assembling them. Some were a little loose. So I ended up actually using glue on absolutely every one of them just to make sure the bases don't come off during play, which just gets annoying. Now, by doing this, I also had to toss out the cardboard box insert to be able to get everything to fit back in the box. But doing that, you can fit it all back in the box. 
Not that the insert was anything to write home about in the first place. No, it was just a cardboard trough like you find in many games. Now, I will note, if you happen to back this on Kickstarter or you bought the miniatures for this game separately, there's no way. They're not going to fit in that box. You have a bunch of miniatures to display somewhere that you're going to have to grab off your shelf to play this game. There is no way they're fitting in the box. Now, with these standees on the punch board are a bunch more cardboard counters. There's a bunch of player boards, as well as a tile for the Regis. Um, everything's two-sided, features some really nice, iconic Robotech artwork. You really can't go wrong with Robotech artwork. Um, you do get a number of cards in this game. I would say this is a card-driven game. Um, and the cards are odd to me because they have that really nice high-end linen finish that you tend to only get in like fantasy flight games or really successful Kickstarters. But then the card quality is very thin. It just seems kind of odd to have such good quality finish on thin cards. Like they do feel a bit flimsy. But to be honest, this isn't the kind of game where you hold a hand, you don't have a hand of cards, they're just down on the table, and you're not shuffling often, you just shuffle at the beginning of the game and that's it. So I don't think you have to worry about the quality of the cards being a problem, I just thought it was odd to have that linen finish with such a thin card. Now, Invasion also comes with 15 custom six-sided dice, a standard D6, and some wood tracker cubes. All in all, a perfectly reasonable, if not high-end, set of components which is a reasonable trade-off at this price point. Fair enough. Now, finally, though, we do get to the one component issue, and that is the rule book, which, similar to other games in this series, unfortunately, is a bit of a hot mess. Uh, the layout is terrible. Like, there is a glaring issue right near the start uh, of the page where you have a sentence and ends part way that says, like, you and nothing, and doesn't continue until three pages later. So that you don't, you have to flip three pages to find out the end of that sentence. Uh, there's a section that says, pick one of two options. And it says, one, do this. And then there's never a two. Um, added to that, there are a number of rules that just aren't clear or downright ambiguous. And to be honest, to be fully able to play this game, you're going to have to sit down with your group and decide how you're going to interpret those rules. Now, this is a co-op game. So... If it's going to happen in any game, I think it's better that it happened in a cooperative game because you're all on the same page, right? So no ruling is going to give any one player an, an, an advantage over anyone else. And you shouldn't get into arguments about what things need because it's going to affect all of you. See, this is a tough one for me. Personally, I have a really hard time supporting a game that can't nail its rules. Mm -hmm. uh, if you as the player want house rule things in a game, that's fine. We've talked about house ruling plenty of times. Mm -hmm. But if you can't actually play the game without sitting down and, and, and do house rules? Is it a complete game? Well, see, this isn't Masters of the Universe, which we reviewed before. And, and if you want an enjoyable read, find that on our blog. You can play this game. Like there are rules for everything in this box. And some of the issues I mentioned are just layout. They're, they're not actually a problem. Even the section where I said, there's one option where it says one and there's no two. Well, after that first option, there's a big letter or, so you can see what the other option is. It's just that whoever did the layout of this, you know, created a numbered list and only put the first item and forgot to add the second item. Like I almost wonder if it was written in word or something, because that's how you end up with paragraphs that end up ending three pages later. At least every time I use word, it's like that. But there are things though that are totally ambiguous and you're going to have possible arguments or at least discussions about them. Like our first game, Deanna and I spent a lot of time passing the book back and forth going, well, I read this and I think it means this. What do you think? Like, how do you interpret this? Okay, this is how I interpret this. Now, after our first game, uh, besides going online to Board Game Geek and seeing some of the answers from the designer, uh, we were able to sit down and go, okay, this is what we're going to play it like. So we came up with rulings for everything and we we're easily able to finish the game. Though, did we play by rules as intended? I have no idea. Right. Yeah. So now that you have some idea of what you get in the box, how about you walk us through how to play? All right. Start the game of Invid Invasion. You first have to decide which of the Robotech defenders you're going to use. There are six to choose from. And every game, you have to use at least four of them, no matter how many players you're playing with. Now, the player playable characters include Rook Bartley, Rand, Scott Bernard, Lancer Belmont, Jim, Lunk, Austin, and Sue Graham. Note, you can play with only one to six players, but if you play with less than six players, one or more players is going to have to control more than one hero. Like, if you're playing solo, you still decide. Like, you could play solo with four heroes, or you could play solo with six or five. That's totally your choice. But if you have less than six, you are going to have to play more than one character. 
Now, once you know who's controlling who, you collect all the stuff for that player. So there's a player board, some cards, some standees, turn tokens, mecha, etc. You get all your player stuff, put it in front of you. Now, every hero starts in their base mecha, which for most characters is their cyclone. Of course, Lunk has a jeep, which is shown on the player board. It's like built into it. You're going to use those red cubes that we mentioned in the components, and you're going to track your armor and your dice pool number on this player board. Now, each character also has a unique ability, and each mech has a unique ability. Most of these can be used once per turn. Some of them can be used all the time. And you have little tokens that you flip if you use them. So just an easy way to keep track of have you used your ability or not. So simple enough uh, for player characters and with asymmetry as well. Always nice, as listeners of this show know. Yeah, the characters are actually very different. Their stats are different. Their abilities are different. They are very unique. And they are very fitting for what the characters did in the show, at least in some cases. So Scott's the leader of the group. His ability is to use anyone else who's at the table at that time's ability, but he can only do it once per other character. So if you have all six characters, Scott's actually more useful. So the more people on his team, the more useful Scott is, which again, fits the series well. Now, once you've chosen your characters, you're going to populate the main board. It's just a big grid. That's it's a grid with a bunch of trackers on it. That's really all the board suffices for. Um, you're just going to fill it with assault cards about based on the number of players. You're going to shuffle the gear cards as a spot to put them. And then you're going to put three trackers on the board. So one of them is to track the game round. There's another one to track the group's protoculture amounts, how much protoculture your team has collected. And then the last one is to track the bro group's protoculture signature total. This becomes very important later. Note it's the total of the protoculture signature. Finally, your players are each going to pick where they want their character to enter on the left west side of the board, and each character has to be in a different row. So the stronger the energy source, the more noticeable it is by the invid, which is that protoculture signature yes. uh, idea. They, 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 the invid are there to find the protoculture. They're there but because of the protoculture. So if you're pumping out a lot of it with your giant mech, they're going to focus on you. Exactly. Now, a game of Invid Invasion, as I mentioned earlier, is broken into two parts. The first phase is the assault phase. Players are trying to break through the Invid lines and reach reflex point. They need to do this before the six-round turn timer runs out. Now, in addition to breaking through, you're also going to want to destroy as many Invid as possible, because any cards left on the board in this stage are going to be replaced by stronger cards in the next phase. The other thing is you got to watch that protoculture signature because each round, all your mecha generates a protoculture signature and that gets added to that total. Well, that total is the main bosses, the Regis's health in the next phase. And those new cards are newer, better troops directly under control of the Regis and less good stuff mixed in for you. Yeah, you're not going to find any allies or gear cards once you're in the Regis phase, just bigger and badder invid in that phase. And when I say bigger and better, you're going to need something better than a, a cyclone to take those out. Now, sticking with the assault phase, we haven't worried, don't worry about the Regis yet. So each turn in the assault phase, your character is going to take actions. Each character has an action dice pool. The size is determined by what mecha they're in. Now, these dice are used to do a number of things, like you spend a die to move one spot, you can spend dice to search for gear and protoculture, you can fight the invid or try to escape from the invid. And they all come from the same pool. Now, one of the things that's fascinating in this game is that you can almost interrupt other players' turns. Not one player has to use their entire dice pool. So I could move, then Sean could use his character to do something, then I can attack an invid, and then Sean could do something else. Like, you don't have to finish your whole turn. And I've never seen that before in a co-op game, and I love it in this, because it really comes up with some interesting ways that your characters can work together. Now, in addition to actions that you spend dice for, there are some you can do for free like using those gear cards you found, using your character or your mech abilities, or flipping over a face-down invid card, because at the beginning, everything's face down. Now, when you do flip over a card, that might trigger a special ability. So there's things like ambush and spores. Um, you're going to resolve that. I'm not going to get into the details here of exactly what they do, but you're going to resolve that, and then you have to decide right then and there, do you either fight the invid or try to escape? Fighting the invid is simple. But interesting, each invent card has a health number on it. You choose how many of your dice from your dice pool to use, roll that number, and then count out the bangs, the explosion symbols on the dice. If the number of bangs meets or beats the health of the invid, you destroy it, and you get the reward on the card, which is always some protoculture and maybe some gear. Now, if you fail to get enough bangs, you just wasted your dice. Like, there's no ongoing damage. There's no tracking health. You either kill the invid or you don't. Invid? 
are tough, so that's not actually all that unfair. Enemy that aren't defeated will counterattack, rolling a number of dice equal to their attack value and doing damage to your armor equal to the number of bangs rolled. Again, you're using the same dice. Now, if at any time your armor hits zero, you're ejected from your mecha and can do nothing with that character until the mecha is repaired or you get into a new one. Now, there is an advantage to being on foot that you might want to take advantage of because you're no longer generating any protoculture signature and the invid won't attack you on foot. The invid have always been pretty one track minded. So use those use those uh, sneakers. <laughs> now, instead of fighting an invid, you also have the chance to escape. That's your or option. Every invid has an escape rating. You choose a number of dice, you roll, you compare the bangs to the escape rating. If you beat it, you get away. Equal or beat it, you get away. If you fail, the invid counterattacks. Basically the same way as combat, but smaller. You, it, they're usually a lot easier to escape than to defeat. Now, along with all this, the attacking and escaping, there's this whole thing with engage and attack tokens for tracking which invid or fighting which characters, and you can't move away if you're engaged, but I don't want to get into all the details here. That's just a little bit too much for, for this type of review. Plus, there's a thing like invid spore clouds. Uh, you know what? Pick up the game, try it out for yourself. You'll figure out what the spore clouds do. I, I just don't want to get into the details about them degrading every turn and stuff like that. So it's a simple combat system, but there's so much more going on around that combat system that makes it interesting. Yeah, I really like the push. I think you'd love the push your luck element. The how many dice do I use? Like, do I, he's got four health. Do I use four dice? I got a pretty good chance. Or do I throw five or do I throw six to hope I get it? Or do I just roll three dice or two dice and hope I get a double bang roll? So it's definitely an interesting thing. Now, I will note one thing thematically. I keep saying invid cards. Not all the Invid cards are actually Invid. Many of the cards are things like Invid Sympathizers and other obstacles that Scott and his crew face during the anime series. Now, in addition to discovering the Invid, some of the cards are actually allies or caches of gear. Now, when you do that, you're going to collect the ally, you're going to get the gear, but then you're always going to replace it by the new Assault card off the deck. And then you're still going to encounter some form of Invid. Now, these allies work like gear and break the rules in some way, but they don't take up gear slots because you can only hold three gear. But again, that's a little bit more minutia than I think we need to get into here. So you might get something good, but you don't get away scot-free. <laughs> You're still fighting something along the way. Yeah, no matter what. Because even if you drew another ally, it would say the same thing. You'd collect it and then draw another card. You are going to face an invader, or a sympathizer, or some type of enemy at some point. Now, while battling your way across the board, you can spend protoculture that you've gotten from beating up Invid or for searching. These can be spent to do a number of things like changing the form of your mecha. Because at the beginning of the game, you have your cyclone and your cyclone has its bike form and its armored form. Once you're in the second half of the game, there's more mecha. Uh, you could just get into a new mecha instead of repairing ones. You can repair your mecha. You can reroll dice. Um, there's even a way where you can spend a ton of it to lure an Invid to your location to possibly clear a path or to get taking something out. Now, swapping mecha is a big part of this game. And usually when you swap mecha, it means more armor and more dice and thus more actions every round, as well as providing some kind of new special ability. Though I thought it was interesting that a lot of the base special abilities seem better than the other mecha. So I think by getting the additional dice and armor, you're kind of giving up a really good power. Now, when swapping mecha and when getting knocked out of your mech on foot, you are meant to switch the standee you're using, which is why there are so many. Every character actually has five different standees that you could swap out during the game. Now, this doesn't have any mechanical effect, but it just looks cooler when everyone's in their proper mecha on the board. So, protoculture is just energy. So, you can think of it as action points with a fancy name. Yeah. It all makes sense using it that way. Now, after all characters have spent their dice and used their gear and abilities and protoculture they want to, you then move on to the invid phase. And no, this isn't the second phase of the game. I apologize. That's It's a subpart of the assault phase. As noted, the rulebook's not as clear by using the term phase for two different things. But in the invid phase, you start by checking to see if you've made it clear. So the first thing you do is look, is there a path east to west? Is there a line with no cards? If you did it, you made it to the Regis phase and you jump over there right now. You don't finish the rest of the phase now assuming you haven't cleared the path any engaged invid will attack the characters they're engaged with any non-engaged invid will move towards the nearest character and engage them um, if there's ever any ties they'll go for the person with the highest protoculture signature and then when invids attack it's the same combat system as that happened during a player turn same counter attack system except now they're attacking 
And that's the first time where that protoculture signature comes in. You want to be less noticeable by the invid. Although, if you're the big tank with lots of armor, maybe you want to be the most noticeable, and that is an aspect of the game. Now, after all the invid attacks are done, you're going to use that protoculture signature again. Every single person's mecha has a signature rating. Some of the gear, like missiles, have a signature rating. You're going to add all those up, and you're going to add it to the protoculture signature tracker. Again, I wish they had better names, but it's the tracker that's on the board. Now, this number is just gets added to, right? So at the end of the round, you're going to go, okay, I got five, six. And most of our games, it was between 11 and 15 at the beginning of the game. And it really ramped up later in the game. And you're going to up that level. Finally, there's a little bit of cleanup at the end of the thing regarding the spore clouds, um, the attack tokens flip back over to the engage side. And more importantly, you move the round marker one spot. Now, if that round marker hits the last space, which is a nice skull and crossbones, the game is over. It's considered if you lose during the asphalt phase that the characters are overwhelmed by Invid. Eventually, the Earth is destroyed by the expeditionary force in space coming in from Jupiter. And this is why you always want to use your shadow technology and let those Invids know you have the power to scare <laughs> off the forces of the Regis. Now, once your brave characters have punched a line through the Invid forces in the assault phase, it's time to move to the Regis phase. This is the actual second part of the game. Now, this starts by counting up any remaining assault cards on the board, face up or face down, then clearing it. You're also going to reset the round marker to the start of the track. You then reset up the board using the Invid, putting the Regis in the middle, which is a, a two, takes up two spot tile. Uh, you're going to surround it by Korg and Sarah, which are two named Invid, two Genesis pits, and two pit creatures. And this way you make a complete circle around the Regis. So there's no direct route to her. You're then going to draw a number of Regis cards based on the number of assault cards you cleared. So whatever was left over from last phase become better cards. You're then going to further surround the Regis with these, which is just this like spiral pattern you follow. Sarah and Korg technically being brother and sister created by the Regis after the disappearance of Princess Ariel, uh, also yes. known as... Uh, What's her name? Um, I mentioned it later, Maria, and I'm yeah, drawing Maria, a complete... Melinda? Melinda? I'm drawing a blank. Shoot. It's terrible. Oh, my bad. All right. Marlene. 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 Yes, Princess Ariel, better known to Marlene by the characters. Uh, but for people who don't know the plot, the at this point, the Regis had determined that the ultimate form of being on the planet were humans, so started converting her self first and then her progeny into humanoid form. Now, the goal of this phase is for your team to defeat the Regis. Now, remember, as mentioned earlier, the Regis's health is equal to the protoculture signature tracker level. So the more protoculture signature you generated during the assault phase, the tougher the Regis is going to be now. And along with that, any changes to protoculture signature now are actually affecting her health directly. So if you start gaining protoculture signature, she's gaining health. And if you lose protoculture signature, she's losing health. Now, you're going to take the party. You're going to split it. I know they say never split the party, but you're going to split the party evenly, and everyone's got to decide which side they start on, either the east or the west side of the Regis, but you're always coming in from two fronts. You're then going to put your character standees on empty spots and then start going through the, the next phase. Now, one last thing you can do is the character's fighter mecha are now unlocked. These are the, the ships, the alphas and the betas. At the start of the Regis phase, everyone can spend protoculture to upgrade to their new mecha, picking between one of the two forms, Guardian or Battleoid. And this has no protoculture signature cost at all at this point. Whereas if you're in the phase and you get into these mecha, you are going to generate a significant amount of protoculture jumping into these new mecha. So I strongly recommend anyone playing this game, make sure you have at least enough protoculture saved up to get all of your characters into their final mechs before getting to this fight. Showing up to the final battle with no protoculture is a bad idea. Yes. Yeah, a lot of the second half is dependent on what you did in the first half. Now, once everything's set up, the rest of this phase plays pretty much similar to the assault phase, except the Regis, Korg, and Sarah each have their own special actions that happen in a very specific order. Now, every round, the Regis is going to act. You roll a die and see what the Regis does. Sarah is going to generate some spore counters on the board. And it's only after those two things happen the players even get to go. Uh, now, the player actions are the same as in the previous phase. However, in the Regis phase, everything's ramped up. 
Now, assuming your characters now in their alpha beta fighters, the dice pools are going to be way bigger. Like when you're on a cyclone, you're looking at a dice pool like six, seven. When you're in one of these big back here, you're looking at 13, 14 dice instead. I think Shadowrun and Champions players would dig this phase of this game. But along with this, the invid you're facing have tons of health like Korg has 14 15 and Sarah has 14 and the pit monsters have seven and nine so it's just kind of everything ramps up it's more epic because it's the big final battle and I gotta say there's something to be said for throwing that handful of dice on the table now after the players act you're gonna check the protoculture signature tracker if it's at zero you win you have defeated the Regis and saved the earth now if it's not zero you're gonna keep playing so now you've all gone the regis has gone sarah's gone now the invid on the board are going to move and attack again similar to the way they act in the assault phase engaged are going to attack and ones that aren't engaged are going to move and become engaged and so on once all them have gone then korg does a special attack which is nasty it's a six die attack against the person with the highest health after all invid attacks you then do the whole adding up the protoculture signature thing so now you're in your bigger mechs probably you're probably going to generate a lot more and you're going to add that to the tracker and again you're giving health back to the regis because she thrives on protoculture finally you got some cleanup stuff again sport tokens degrade attack tokens are flipped to engage and the round marker is moved up and so on and so on and so on yes though not too many so on six maximum because the game continues until either the regis is defeated and you win or the round marker reaches the end of the track and the game is over. Again, this represents the expeditionary force is left with no choice but to destroy the entire Earth to destroy the Invid. Now, at this point, I want to state that Robotech is cool. Like, really cool with a huge cannon. Mm -hmm. As such, we actually spent a good deal of time looking at wikis and forums and actually analyzing episodes to figure out a couple of things that don't really change the gameplay at no. all, but how one is interpreting the gameplay and how it fits or doesn't into canon. Yeah, there are some definitely interesting design choices here. But before I get into that, I just want to mention the other games in the series, right? So I will say that I was a bit disappointed by the first two Robotech games released by Solar Flare. They weren't bad games. It just it didn't give me what I wanted. So Force of Arms is a rather simple mass game based game that's extremely short. Like you can finish a game in 15 minutes. Like this is a quick filler more than a full gaming experience. It's fun for what it is, but it didn't give me an epic Robotech feel. Now Robotech Crisis Points, while featuring some similar mechanics to Force of Arms, was a much deeper, more involved game. It was also much more enjoyable and engaging than Force of Arms, but it did have a fair share of rough edges, including a rather ambiguous rulebook. Now, the other thing I found with both of these games, it just didn't feel like I was playing Robotech, right? It felt like either of them could have been rethemed to anything. I could have been battling Pokemon. I could have been having a space battle. I could have been I, I, throwing darts or something. Like, I honestly think either of those games could easily be rethemed to pretty much any license or just played as an abstract game. They didn't even have to have names on them. It could have just said, add, remove tokens. But there are very few Robotech games, and fans will generally take whatever they can get. And again, I will note they were both decent games. They just didn't give me that feel I wanted. Now, with Robotech Invid Invasion, we finally have a game that actually feels like I'm taking on the role of Robotech Defenders, facing off against near insurmountable odds. In Invid Invasion, you're playing a small band of rebels who are facing and trying to break through an army of invid in order to reach reflex point and then defeat the invid regis along the way you're going to swap swap your cyclones into the more powerful armored suit version or armoring up your jeep if you happen to be lunk uh you'll come across allies like annie and marlene and you'll have to deal with invid super sympathizers and even the outlaw dusty airs makes an appearance in this game so while there are some questionable canon aspects to this game, there are in the show as well. Mm -hmm. And that's so that's ultimately forgivable in a game that otherwise feels so much more like Robotech than other games in its yeah. uh, ilk. I agree, especially with the assault phase. That really does bring back memories of watching Scott Bernard's band track across the land always trying to find a path to reflex point uh, the driving thing right from the first episode of the show is scott must make it to reflex point. well there are some odd inconsistencies right like for example there are two dusty airs cards 
both of which can be on the board at the same time. And while well, you can defeat Dust Ears twice, which uh, it's a one episode character, or even more so, the one that bothered me the most rewatching the show was Sue is a combatant. Well, Sue in the movie would just recorded video. And why is she a combatant? Like, but even with these inconsistencies, the assault phase just felt like playing through an epic Robotech story. So fans really do have a good bit to draw them in there. Now, sadly, this thematic tie-in falls apart quite a bit in the Regis phase. So the second phase of Invid Invasion is all about battling the Regis' guards, trying to take her down while dealing with other threats like the Genesis pits. Now, what you aren't going to see here is Sarah conflicted over her feelings for Lancer, or the group convincing the Regis to just leave the planet. They never defeat her in the series, they just convince her to leave. Instead, you have this huge epic boss style fight, which oddly features, among other things, the Genesis Pits, which was a one episode obstacle the group dealt with long before they reached Reflex Point and had nothing to do with the final battle. And then we get to some flights of fancy or stretching of cannon. Yes, yeah, there's some definite unique choices here, but I think I get it. Right, uh, Dave, the designer, took some artistic liberties here. Uh, I'm sure he wanted to add the Genesis pits, right? Like, here's this thing there. You find an old Earth. It's a lost world thing where there's prehistoric monsters and dinosaurs. And what's better than mechs fighting dinosaurs, right? And I got to say, like, interpersonal conflict is a huge part of the series, but it really wouldn't fit with this game, which is more of a dice chucker, right? This is a, all about defeating Invid. And I got to say, like, attacking her the regis at the end just fits with the mechanics instead of having a convince her to leave mini game at the end which i admit would probably feel really out of place here even though it might be more thematic like i i honestly i can forgive these inconsistencies and i gotta say it though it just was really glaring because i played this and i'm like oh man my memory of next generation is great so i'm gonna rewatch it and i rewatch the whole thing and then we played again and i was just like Oh, wow. Okay. First time I didn't notice these issues, but now that I just watched the show like a couple hours ago, it, it's kind of glaring. And it doesn't help that we don't know if the games were based purely off of the TV series or if they were the comics or even considered non-canon material like the Palladium source books, which some people think of as canon, but aren't considered such. So I, I actually thought those were canon at the time, just kind of like the old West End game Star Wars books were canon. But yeah, I honestly don't know. All I'm basing this off of is the original TV series. The the I don't remember how many episodes. It's like 60-some episodes. So, Well, if you count all three series... No, no, it's... I'm just talking about just the next generation. Oh, yeah. So it's uh, it's only actually 20... 26 or so? 26, oh, right. But still, it's yeah, yeah. 26 episodes. Now, what I can't forgive here, though, is the Invid Invasion rulebook. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when talking about what you get in the box, it's it's not good. Um, there's glaring layout issues, large number of unclear, ambiguous rules. Um, and even worse, most of them don't come up until you're in that Regis phase. So like the first half of the game felt great and it played really well. And then you get to the second phase, it felt like we were constantly looking up stuff in the rulebook and then having to make rulings. Like stuff like is every encounter card that's not an ally an invid? If every encounter card is an invid, do the Genesis puts move and engage like an invid trooper? If they don't, why do they have an escape rating? Like it just inconsistencies just didn't make sense. There's also a huge issue with the engagement. And, and as the designer pointed out, pits don't move. And I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't tell me why they have an engagement rating. There's just some definite issues with this rule book. And as I mentioned earlier, I do strongly suggest before playing your first game, if you can, sit down as a group and decide how you're going to interpret them. Now, it's going to be difficult if you haven't played yet, so you may not know what they are, but pre be prepared for that. Be prepared to pause the game, sit down, have a conversation, make a ruling and move on. And I got to say, I, I got another 80s flashback when I was doing this because I was remembering playing, say, Warlock of Firetop Mountain or, or Talisman 2nd Edition and coming up with these rules that like, wait, is it the Crown of Command let you do this or this? And you just had to come up with something because it wasn't like there was an internet to look up or you couldn't go find an FAQ online. You were just forced to find a rule and play by that. So in a way, it does bring back that 80s nostalgia that way, too. And I think I've said my piece on what I think of the broken rule books. <laughs> 
Now, perhaps due to these rule ambiguities, um, it's possible Deanna and I broke the game in a manner of speaking. After a couple of plays, I noticed there didn't seem to be any reason to actually keep your mecha repaired. Now, spending protoculture doesn't cost any dice, so you can do it anytime as long as it's your turn. Plus, when dealing damage, excess damage. So when, when you get hit, if you take way more damage than you have armor, you just you lose the difference, right? So if I only have six armor and I take 10 hits, I still only lose six armor and I go to zero. The rest is wasted. Due to this, I honestly don't see why you couldn't just keep everyone's mecha at one armor all the time. Like you wouldn't start at one, you'd have to get knocked down to one, but you get attacked for 10 damage. You take one damage and the rest is lost. That's all wasted. Then after the attack, no more invid will attack you because you're now out of your mech and you're on foot. And you have zero protoculture signature, so you're not giving the Regis health. Then next turn, it comes back. You spend one protoculture to repair your mech to one health. You get all your dice pulled back, and you can take all your actions again. Now, if you happen to hit zero through a counterattack, you again spend one protoculture to repair and continue your turn. The only worry you have with this is running out of protoculture, but you probably, if you weren't doing this, are going to be spending nine and 10 and six to repair your mech every turn. Like, I think you're actually going to use less protoculture this way than you would if you tried to keep everyone healed all the time. Now, maybe I'm missing something here. Like I said, the rules aren't the clearest, but I'm not sure what. So if you've played Robotech Invid Invasion, and I got to admit, looking at board game geek ratings and that, I don't think a lot of you have. But if you have played this and can see any reason why this won't work, please let me know. Now, what I will say is once we did discover this, once I figured this out, we decided not to use it because it seemed really unthematic. Like, oh, all these half beat up mechs that we just barely jury rate to keep fighting seemed dumb. And it kind of felt like cheating. But I still can't see why it wouldn't work based on the raw rules as written. And while there are some clarifications of rules on Board Game Geek, not everything is addressed and some things are addressed uh, less than adequately. Yeah, I agree. Now, despite these rulebook issues and the fact that Regis phase kind of breaks from canon completely, um, we've had a lot of fun playing this game, like way more than I thought I would. That assault phase is really fun. It is particularly fun and engaging. Every time we've run through it, it's been completely different, just due to the randomness of the cards and trying out different characters every time. I still haven't used all six, I'll admit it. Uh, we've just been doing groups of four characters, two each, and swapping up who's playing who. Um, well, we've only played with low player counts with everyone controlling more than one. I have, I just, I picture playing this specifically at uh, the local game store. Uh, so I picture it different because they move and I don't even know what it looks like in there. I picture the old, old uh, CG realm when they were on the corner at Tecumseh and, and uh, Hall there and, and like having six people playing and I could see other people standing around watching us play to see what happens. And like with the standees and it just feels like this epic fun event and, People who know the series quoting it and talking about all kinds of different aspects of the show. And, oh, I remember seeing him. And you flip up an Invid card and you're like, oh, look, it's Dusty Ayers. Remember when Dusty Ayers did this? I just think that would be an epic game night. I really want to play this at the FLGS in public with other Robotech fans. Yeah, I have to say, I commented on Twitter during your uh, play posts about this mm -hmm. not being all that interesting to me. But going through this review and in part doing the research on Robotech and, and rewatching mm -hmm. some episodes and digging through the wiki has given me a lot more interest in it. Yep. Though definitely at the higher player counts where you can have more fun rather than taking it too seriously as a two player, you know, adventure and, and focused down optimizing sort of thing. optimizing though i think you have to if you're gonna win this by the end round so i don't know we'll have to decide that that'll be my final question we wrap up here do we add this to the sean must play it <laughs> games because i know you weren't expecting much at all from this yeah. and we're expecting a pretty negative review and i'll admit before sitting down and playing it i i did have my misgivings now the one thing i don't want to do and i have no interest in doing is playing through all three games in a row that dave supposedly designed it for that like while the first two games are rather short like force of arms is dead short this is not a quick game like every game we played has blown away the 120 minute play time listed on the box like we haven't even come close one game lasted over four hours and that's with only two people like throw six people arguing about what to do and it's just going to be even longer the other thing that i just think would be weird is like he set this up as an epic game night, right? But the first two games are two player only. So you're just going to play two players in, in the first game, two players in the second, then this is six. 
that's just kind of weird for an epic game night where are you going to get those other players are you do you need three copies of force of arm and everyone pairs off so that all six join together at the end i don't know it's just kind of weird it, it, it's a it's a weird idea that they changed player counts and the other thing is the first two games were competitive right so it's head to head it's zentradi versus the rdf and then the next game is the um army of the southern cross versus the masters no this is everyone versus the game the invit it just seems like an odd thing to play those games in a series I, I get the idea dave i think it's a it's a cool concept but i can't see doing it yeah as opposed to three in a row i think the games each hit a different market nicely uh with the light filler a bit more of a robust two-player and mm-hmm. then that big group battle game yep no i agree i they're definitely th- cater to three different crowds while trying to cater to the robotech fans Overall, I, I think it's pretty obvious. I'm impressed. Um, well, the rule book uh, could be clearer, and there's some interesting artistic liberties taken with the plot and the story that deviate from the series it's based on. This is the first board game I played that feels like I'm taking part in a Robotech story. If you're looking for Robotech in board game form, you know how people like to say, that, like, this is Star Wars, the board game. This is Star Trek, the board game. This is Robotech, the board game. This is the first place you should look if you're looking for a Robotech board game. Out of the games I played, there are others out there I haven't tried. Now, of all the Robotech games from Solar Flare, this is the one that most feels like you're part of a Robotech epic story. While it has some issues, I think this one is worth any Robotech fan picking up. Robotech gamer, get this game. And then go review it, because no one's talked about it everywhere. Give it a rating somewhere. Like, Like, no one knows about this game. Now, where I wouldn't recommend this game is for gamers who aren't Robotech fans. If you don't care about Robotech, there's nothing totally new here. There's nothing really innovative. It's just another board game, right? Uh, I like some of the mechanics. I like the push your luck dice pool system. I love that you could interrupt each other's actions, like seeing that in a co-op game. Can you imagine like playing Horrified where like you could take one action and someone else could take theirs and you finish up at the end of the round? Oh, it'd be great. But I don't think that's alone is enough to sell this game. Uh, this is for robotech fans it's a robotech game for robotech gamers plus with its complexity i don't think it's a robotech game for robotech non-gamers in that case go look at force of arms or possibly crisis point if you dig those then maybe step up to this one all right well read more about robotech invid invasion you can check out our written review over at tabletopbellhop.com And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, I've been out of commission most of the time since our last episode, so mainly been laying on the couch watching a lot of stuff on Netflix. Um, Now, the only gameplays I've gotten in are Robotech Invid Invasion, and while I think we shared enough about that game during the review, but I do want to mention one thing. So after playing the first game of Invid Invasion, I realized just how long it's been since I watched Robotech. Now I do have this really nice DVD deluxe set called the Protoculture Collection that has all three series, every episode, and like 10 discs of special features, including things like the, the, the toy show presentation of the Matchbox toys and all this cool stuff. And various times since getting this, I've sat down, I'm like, I'm sick. I'm going to watch Robotech from start to finish or whatever. It's March break. I'm like, I've owned that this probably long enough that I would had March break. (laughs) I'd sit down and rewatch the series. But every time I went, I'm going to start at the beginning and I'm going to watch Rick take off in his stunt flyer at the beginning. And I start with the Macro Sagra and always end up petering out before getting to the end. Like Robotech's good, but I can only take so much in a row. So what I decided to do is grab that box set and just start at the new generation. The, the series this game's based on and i end up watching the entire thing four discs worth over two days so i just blew through it now each episode is only like 20 some minutes right you're talking kids cartoon time especially if you skip the intro and the exit and the on our next episode because that was a big thing back then now doing that i've got to say my memory of robotech uh, at least next generation was way worse than i thought um there's there's a good chance i've never actually seen the next generation in order ever because the way they used to show it at least here in windsor was like one day it was macross the next day it was masters and the third day it was next generation and then would repeat and i think they showed them in order but like if you just missed one episode like i have no idea what order they're in so i think i grew up seeing random episodes and i think it was my favorite because it was my favorite of the three was just because the cyclones were so cool And they're still really cool, these bikes that become mecha armor, right? 
So what watching the series again did was make me look at the game in a brand new light. Uh, some things were improved, right? Like the game got better from rewatching it. Like I, I love how many non-invid are on that deck, right? How many invid sympathizers and non-invid cards there are. Because the first play, I was like, what's with all these gangs and what's with all these bikers and what what what's going on and well when you watch the series a heck of a lot of it is dealing with these biker gangs and these these very cyberpunk like gangs uh very 80s actually now a lot of this series is actually the characters dealing with other humans and not the invid at all and it was usually hiding and from the invid and then dealing with the, the local problem it was actually very much like an old star trek episode right it was episodic it was, what are they going to discover this week and it was often other humans generally doing terrible things to each other because the invid are there it kind of predates the walking dead or or van helsing but had that whole same kind of uh story beats to it but then there were other things that made even less sense having just watched the series like why is sue a playable character like i i really don't get this because in the series, she's a war journalist, and she refuses to get involved and ends up in a huge fight with Scott over the fact she didn't intercede and just watched and filmed her entire squad getting killed. And then does the same thing to the heroes of the show. Like, she dies after one episode, never raising a gun, only her camera. And it was a really poignant moment in the series that's just gone, lost by this game because she's just another player character with her own cyclone all of a sudden. She has her own fighter mech and they gave her a green beta, which doesn't even exist in the series. And she's fighting alongside the team. Like, oh, it's terrible. Like, like, like it was such an important character that had such a point to make that the war, you can't just be a bystander and here they just throw it away and made her another player character. And then there's the whole thing about the Regis phase and the review and everything else. Like, I get it. It's a game, and it's trying to use the same mechanics throughout, but, like, why did they change the end? Like, well, why why isn't the, the Regis taking all the protoculture and leaving? Why are you killing her? Why are you beating her up? There was no beating up in the Regis. It was everyone standing around talking to her, trying to convince her to leave the planet. Like, and even if they just changed the wording to say you're not damaging her, you're rolling dice to convince her to leave, it at least would have been closer. And like by that point, Sarah had already joined the side of the characters and here you are fighting her. And why is she making spores? Spores have nothing to do with Sarah. Like, I, I it's so yeah. weird. It, the choices it's that were made. Because again, I hadn't rewatched this. So I was going through the review and, and as the term came up that I, that I gave me some pause with my ancient memory of the show, <laughs> I would Google it. And, and I was digging through the Robotech wiki now, the Robotech wiki is pretty good about how they break things up into the different series mm -hmm. and they keep comics separate and, and, you know, things are pretty well referenced. But it's interesting because there are certain things in the show that are canon and kind of important canon, but are based off of a throwaway line one sentence long. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we discovered today is is Mo wasn't clear about a certain aspect of how the show ended yeah. Because 12 minutes into the episode, she said one sentence that actually is kind of a big deal, but it was a sentence halfway through the Plus episode. Plus, it still, I think, could be interpreted <laughs> both ways. Possibly. Like, uh, it just wasn't, to be honest, it's all Robotech. It's a bunch of white yeah. guys converting an anime and making up their own story and there's lots of loopholes and inconsistencies yeah i mean and, and as as you know in case people don't know most of the anime of the time was made up of you take a japanese show or in some cases multiple japanese shows cut and paste them into an american fast-paced action show and then overdub whatever the heck you want because it doesn't matter what the original yeah. show was because you've chopped it up now, Robotech was just one show that they that they cut and pasted with, unlike shows like Voltron, where there were like five different shows yes. that made up Voltron. Um, it they were all actually one. Micronauts, yeah. from so, what I understand. So, yeah, I mean, so it, it did start from one set of content, but it was cut and pasted into a whole world of mess. <laughs> So Deanna did have a question. Did he base it off of the Japanese version? I would assume not, because everything here indicates that it's it's yeah. The, it does the, seem to it's the American names. Yeah, it it does it does base itself mostly off the American. Well, to be show. honest, it has Harmony Gold on the box, so it's based off oh, the oh, American yeah. version. 
so Harmony, that's the license it's license from Harmony Gold. I, you know what? There was, there's a, we talked about Tubi before, Tubby or whatever it's called. All of these were on there, all three of the series in Japanese. And I'm like, I'm going to sit down and watch the Japanese versions. Gone. And I don't know if they didn't have the license or what, but they're all gone. So I want to watch it. I don't know. Plot deviations, like Sean mentioned before, could be he's using stuff in the role playing games. It could be based on the comic books. Um, plus, there is a series that Palladium created with Harmony Gold that follows up and supposedly wraps up the whole series called the shadow chronicles. I remember watching that once on a bootleg um, with like eight other uh, VHS tapes tied together. So we all got our copies, but I only watched that once. And I honestly don't remember um, if it tied in. Yeah. I read and up like, on it on that some today, but I kind of blacked it out because it, it doesn't, it should. Yeah, it, it it, I, maybe it tied this. in something but like so. the whole concept of protoculture doesn't exist in the Japanese version. And the flower of life doesn't exist in the Japanese. That's all something the Americans added to make this part of a trilogy that wasn't a trilogy. Right. All right. Well, enough of the uh, enough of the anime. How about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right. So as mentioned earlier at the top of our AMA, I've got some train games to play. And while at least one of those is still in a box, so I'm going to get some unboxings done. I know I've said this many times recently. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't been up for recording anything the last 12 days or so. Uh, so I am a little behind on unboxings. I'd like to keep up on those. So I sat down with Deanna earlier today and planned our weekend, and we're probably going to be doing a game night Sunday, Saturday. So those unboxings have to happen before that. So watch for a go live notification, watch for something. Um, maybe if uh, Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, isn't free tomorrow or something, I might do it tomorrow night. Um, I can't, I don't want to do it while the kids are doing school because they're all over the internet during the day, even though they're usually quiet. So it's probably going to happen after they go to bed. So probably Thursday or Friday night, I'll open some stuff up. I'd like to do it tomorrow. So we'll see. I don't want to shoot people down for what we usually do on Thursday night, though. So, <laughs> but it's, it's, though it's it has been a, been a long time. It's been a month. I think if one more week wouldn't kill us if we had. Yeah, to. I know. I just feel bad. <laughs> so yeah, I've got I've got a little wordy. I got Irish Gage, and well, those of you here in the lobby, stick around, and you'll find out what's in those two boxes over there. And I I don't know how many of them I'll be able to do because again, five seems to be the limit. So I think a couple of these are going to be really short and quick. So we'll see. Alrighty. So yeah, play some uh, unbox some games play some train games that's that's the goal or some games with train themes if we want to try to keep everyone happy so that might be our topic next week i'm seriously considering it it, it, it depending on how we get through these games if we don't get through all of them by this weekend um because we don't just necessarily play on saturday we might be able to get another game night in but saturday is a sp set aside for gaming um if we don't get them all played, we might put it off a week. So we might spend next week talking about what is a train game. Though really, Sean and I aren't experts at arguing the the, the other side of the argument, but I think that's fine. We, what do we think is a train game? That might be next week. Or it'll be, what are the best next step train games from Ticket to Ride? One of those two. And you can kind of see why we're thinking about talking about one before the other. All righty, here we go. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. David Miller Jr. Thanks, David. Brian Kurtz. As always, thanks, Brian. Yuho Rutila. Thank you. Jeff Seuss. Looking forward to potentially gaming with you in five or six months. <laughs> I really hope. I, I do hope that, that it's starting to see a light at the end of the tunnel. I hope it's true. Uh, Kevin Reno. Had to win the digital game, eh? Not, not you know, Space Base or the one of the ones that, that we wouldn't have to ship. You had to win the digital one. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued effort, please consider tipping your bellhops at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.